Scott and Marcus Sita, who are the program directors. 
and um, also for the support from Dean Hall and Harris, who um, unfortunately had a conflict and was unable to make it here today. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, to what the symposium is. Um, the symposium, Mediating Realities, focuses on the question of the real and how various figures of reality and unreality continue to act on contemporary discourse. The question isn't, what is real? It's a formulation that's leveraged to substantiate or subvert known realities. But why the real? Why do we continue to reconstruct the trope of the real, and how do these methods of construction operate on discourses and practices? How might we locate these practices in a milieu which is all at once lived, simulated, abstracted, performed, quantified, financialized, reimagined, represented, falsified, reconstructed, and so on and so on and so on. Um, today we have asked these questions to a range of speakers, um, the range from people who are in digital media, focusing on cinema, um, economics, as well as public uh, spaces, um, that will be performing a discussion within these three specific panels of real public, real time, and real economics. Um, which we hope will elucidate the objects, communities, histories, futures, markets, enterprises, and architectures which are activated beyond conventional oppositions of reality and fantasy. Um, today we have, uh, excuse me, the symposium is producing its own mediation as well while people are up on the panels um, and how it's being recorded. This discussion will be using will be filtered through real-time engagements through a number of live platforms, such as Tumblr, hashtags, and Twitter, and live streaming. Um, this meta-mediation performs the task of how information is disseminated and remembered, and how these are bridged as interactions that can be described as part of the real and part of our current discussions. Um, to how this becomes relevant um, to the public is what is being debated. To introduce our first panel of publics is CCCP student Virginia Black, um, who will be talking um, to you about who the first round of students will be. Hi, um, what constitutes a public? This panel interrogates the boundaries of publics within the space of the real. Virtual, imaginary, or some combination thereof through mediators such as the internet, images, tone, humor, memory, heritage, embodiments, urban space, and communities. The variety of definitions of the term public lead us to ponder the construction and implications of public as a constantly shifting terrain defined by articulation rather than modest discrete states. Questions abound. Are publics defined by collective actions, shared properties, spaces, events, or less distinct cultural imaginaries? How do they come into being? Where and how are publics operated? And after such transformations, what are the remaining claims to the real? Our speakers, Gabriella Coleman, David A. Banks, and Mary Taylor, address these questions through a variety of approaches. Gabriella Coleman holds the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy. Um, and is the author of two books on computer hackers, Coding Freedom, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Hacking, Reference to University Press, published in 2013, and Hacker Hoaxer, um, Whistleblower Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous, um, published by Verso in 2014. Gabriella's research of the Anonymous Collective requires her direct involvement as an actor within the networked public. David A. Banks and Mary Taylor are both applying their knowledge of urbanism to projects which study and test the use of amenities to structure pellets. David A. Banks is a PhD candidate in the Moussaulier Polytechnic Institute Science and Technology Studies Department. His work focuses on the design of organizations, public space, and digital networks from an anarchist perspective. He is currently working to build a mesh Wi-Fi network in North Central Troy, New York, and to build an open source common venue network in Kamasi, Ghana. Mary Taylor's research focuses on sites, techniques, and politics of civic cultivation, social movement, and cultural management, the relationship of ethics and aesthetics to nationalism and cultural differentiation, 
and people's movements in interwar socialist and post-socialist history. Currently, she's working on her book, The Aesthetic Nation, Folk Dance, Populism, and the Ethical Politics of Citizenship in Hungary. She specializes in studying, theorizing, and organizing radical and alternative pedagogical activities under different conditions of urbanization. Co-founder of the Open University, Brooklyn, and of Brooklyn Laundry Social Club. Um, she is the assistant director of the Center for Place, Cultural, Culture, and Politics at the Graduate Center. Um, and then the panel is mediated by Felicity Scott. Um, Felicity D. Scott is associate professor of architecture and co-director of the program in critical, curatorial, and conceptual practices in architecture at GSAP, where she also teaches architectural history and theory. In addition to publishing numerous articles in journals, magazines, and edited anthologies, her book, Architecture or Technotopia, Politics After Modernism, was published by MIT Press in 2007, and Living Archive 7, Man Farm, appeared on Actor Editorial in 2008. She is currently working on a book entitled Outlaw Territories, Environments of Insecurity, Architectures of Counterinsurgency, 1966-1979, which investigates architecture's relation to human kind settlement and territorial insecurity and is to be published by his own books. So today that's quite confusing. Uh, there's a lot of deception, although not everything is about deception. And researching anonymous really felt like I was traversing a maze, and it was at once extremely uh, thrilling, but also extremely frustrating at the same time. Now you can also see the difference that um, there was a subtitle, The Story of Anonymous, and I actually confused that subtitle. I said, there is no story of anonymous. And all complex social phenomena obviously have 
multiple threads and multiple realities, but I actually think it's really inherent to anonymous to be um, multitudinous, uh, prolific, and unpredictable. Those are the three words I would use to really describe the nature of anonymous as a political reality. And it's one of the reasons why they're so incredibly uh, difficult to define. And it's why I instead chose the many faces of anonymous instead. And by the many faces of anonymous, I mean a number of things. Uh, anonymous is a protest <coughs> movement, they popularized digital direct action, which existed before them, but nevertheless, they really put it on uh, the global geopolitical map. It's a communal idea for anyone to take, and that's one of the reasons why they're so multitudinous and unpredictable. It's become a symbol for popular revolt. Uh, there's competing tactics and groups and different political cultures around the different uh, networks that exist. It's a meeting ground between art and politics and also fantasy and political possibilities, uh, which I find very interesting. And the last element as well is quite important too, which is it's a laboratory to experiment in the art of self-effacement and anonymity. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, if there's many faces to um, anonymous, I do think that one can kind of stand back and say that there's been an interesting net effect to the political operations, and there have been over 200 political operations in the last couple of years. And I think the net effect is nicely captured by a quote by uh, Foucault, which plays on masking and unmasking. So the real political task in a society such as ours is to criticize the workings of institutions that appear to be both neutral and independent, to criticize and attack them in such a manner that the political violence that has always exercised itself obscurely through them will be unmasked so that one can fight against them. And there's a nice image that kind of captures that kind of um, dialectic between masking among activists and unmasking um, unmasking political corruption, and that's from Operation Ferguson. So one of the things that is interesting and a little bit odd about Anonymous is that they're uh, grassroots participatory direct action, and so it's very open. Uh, and one of the things that I've actually really loved about meeting people behind the mask is just how weirdly diverse it is. Um, and so I've had folks who are janitors or really just one who um, stopped me in a hallway one day and said, I, I saw you in that film, Love Anonymous, I'm Anonymous. Just the other day, I was at an important government institution that shall remain unnamed, uh, but a scientist who was there was like, I'm you know, a big spectator, supporter of Anonymous. I've met people really from very different walks of life. And um, because there's kind of um, an ambiguity to what anonymous is, it, it allows people to kind of forge their own path to anonymous. So it's very open and very participatory at one level. But it's also very obfuscated. Uh, it's, it's really, really this realm of anonymity, deception, and obfuscation at the same time. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's politically powerful and interesting. Another element that is quite important has to do with the public fusion of art and risky politics and technology. Um, the world of computer hacking is hard for a lot of people to understand, and what Anonymous has done is, even though it's a faceless organization, it's given a face to that realm of activity through its rich, rich, rich visual culture, um, whether it's videos or images. And here um, are a couple that I like quite a bit. And I think it's this quality of straggling on the one hand mythic and artistic space and on the other hand the reality of activists taking risks and taking action that makes the collective so enticing. So if they were just churning out art, uh, they'd be interesting, but probably not as interesting. Um, and likewise, if they were just sort of engaging in action without this kind of collective artistic face, it would also be much harder to grasp. And now just to kind of finish, I think one of the most important elements about anonymous concerns, how they display the virtue of opacity in the high age of surveillance and celebrity. We are in a moment um, where uh, we know surveillance is omnipresent. Uh, the culture of celebrity has been long in the making. Uh, these are you know, slightly two different trends, but anonymous pushes against both of them symbolically 
um, through words and through deeds. But I think something important to consider is how does masking and anonymity work in anonymous and with what wider effect? It's not simply because they're called anonymous that they engage in this kind of politics of obfuscation and anonymity. There's a quote um, by Naomi Klein where she's talking about uh, subcommandante Marcos that I like quite a bit because I think it captures the dynamic in anonymous, although it's accentuated in anonymous, and it concerns with how masking works. So further subjugating himself, Marco says that he's not a leader to those who seek him out, but that his black mask is a mirror reflecting each of their own struggle, that as Zapatistas, anyone, anywhere fighting injustice, that we are you, he once said. Marcos is gay in San Francisco, black in South Africa, and in Asian in Europe, and so on and so forth. And this dynamic, exists in anonymous, but there's no even one single figure. There is truly this kind of faceless entity. So this dynamic kind of helps explain part of its appeal and one of the reasons why it circulated so far. Now I think another kind of really important element of anonymity and anonymous has to do with um, fighting against uh, what Ned Monster and Sankhya Sela have identified in the following terms, anonymity registers the possibilities for both individual and collective refusal to turn our communicative relations into generators expected to power the data-driven enterprises of the experience economy. And one of the things that is so interesting, or was so interesting about studying anonymous, is that while I think I was able to do some kind of traditional social cultural analysis, which I do in my book, they really um, configure themselves in a way that it's very difficult to do kind of classical sociological analysis on anonymous. And I think that's quite refreshing given the fact that we live in an age where everything can be data mined and predicted and here is this very visible entity that refuses that type of analysis and categorization. As a result of their kind of strong insistence on anonymity, it helps prevent celebrity leaders as well. Um, it's of course not the case. There are people who have more authority, who take leadership roles, but in terms of the kind of public interfacing person, uh, they really, really try to prevent that type of, of role. Now another kind of element um, in terms of how anonymity works in anonymous, many of them have different philosophies, uh, some of which are quite um, liberal, others which are more part of a kind of trickster tradition. A lot of people do believe in this kind of liberal creed that I think is captured well by Oscar Wilde when he says man is least himself and he talks to his own person, give him a mask and he'll tell you the truth. So even though there's a lot of deception in the world of anonymous, there is also this insistence that we're being anonymous to lead things to the world, to speak truth to power, uh, and engage with you know the real in a lot of ways. Now, one of the things about anonymous is that it's actually pseudo-anonymous. It's not truly anonymous. People have very stable identities and nicknames, um, and that really has particular effects within the collective itself. And um, one of the most notable ones is there's a huge psychological burden to pseudo-anonymous interaction uh, in an activist space, and I, I kind of like that image to capture that burden. And here is a quote from a hacker who was never caught. Uh, many hackers were caught, some of them were caught because they actually uh, revealed too much about their personal lives. It wasn't a kind of technical security issue, it was the fact that they wanted to say something about their lives. This person wasn't caught, and he says, the hardest for me is the silence. When we have trouble and stress, unlike family or work tensions, there's no one to talk to, no friends who understand, or who I trust with it. The advantage is anons can resurrect, they can come and they can go. For you, I'll keep calling, yeah, that's me, there's no big changes for you. Um, as I mentioned, I think the anonymity uh, augments diversity. Um, and then the real final thing I'm going to kind of finish with is how anonymous really embodies and has this robust taboo against celebrity and fame seeking. It's an ethic that really, really uh, is probably the one ethic that unites different networks and different eras of anonymous. And I'm going to show you two artifacts from field work that show this ethic in action. Next slide will have some strong language. Anonymous is probably the most unpolitically correct um, 
activist group in the world, and then they embrace offensive language, and so there's some of that. If you'll see in operation how this ethic works. So, um, hey, Nick, I see you really love attention and are just a wannabe. Wouldn't be surprised if you're some fed, just like Sabu, who was this um, informant who had been a hacker who'd been flipped, and then this person tries to defend himself, and um, this other person wasn't buying it. The most controversial figure in Anonymous was Barrett Brown, who Kane's Barrett Brown, and he's kind of picked out as Barrett Brown, and there was an eight-page document about him um, where his role was assessed, and people loved him because he did a lot of work. But in the end, people were critical because you seem to imply that you're special and important such that the principles mentioned below anonymity and equality of all do not apply to you. So just to finish, I think Anonymous is fascinating because they came into being quite accidentally, uh, just as society is really starting to talk about surveillance and anonymity. And they do provide a kind of practical, experimental space to engage in the art of self -defense. So I'll leave it at that and turn it over to David. It's a real honor to be on this panel. This is amazing. Uh, so thanks to the, the hosts uh, uh, for this. Um, and uh, Columbia grad students, like you guys uh, unionized. Uh, upstate, I'm uh, an uh, upstate New York private school, and uh, we, we have a lot to learn from you. So congratulations on um, So uh, I, this is uh, my uh, early dissertation work. Um, it's a little uh, in, the, in the baking. So, um, uh, so I'd like to actually start uh, speaking of half baked with a quote from the Bush administration, where um, they, uh, uh, this is um, I was, uh, you brought, uh, this is uh, from a New York Times article from uh, Ron Suskin, uh, where he um, uh, he was quoting an anonymous Bush aide that uh, was later uh, considered the uh, Carl Rove, and this this um, bolded uh, part of it uh, about um, we're an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. Uh, and while you're studying that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again, uh, creating other new realities which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. Um, I think this is a really interesting quote of uh, when you play with the pronouns and who is implicated in that we. Uh, because if the we were also uh, the publication that's quoting him, right? Uh, and, uh, and the you is the individual reader. Um, you know, we can think a lot about what sorts of realities are being constructed, uh, especially when you think later on how the New York Times and lots of other big publications were enrolled in the uh, lead up to the Iraq War. You know, reality is really uh, confusing there, right? Uh, so uh, I, I keep this with me in mind uh, as a Westerner going to uh, a country like Ghana um, doing field work because I want to create these in the work that I want to do, I want to make myself um, kind of um, obsolete uh, after some kind of uh, uh, intervention or some kind of, uh, or just some kind of uh, positive work. Uh, I don't want, um, I don't want to establish a kind of supply chain or relationship that uh, necessitates my constant intervention. I would like to leave and just have something continue on without me. So, um, uh, so, uh, what, so the work that I'm trying to do is to open a, make an open source common vending machine that would um, uh, uh, allow um, artisans and manufacturers there to make it themselves and, um, and eventually just leave me out of it. Uh, so the one on the left is the, um, is the one I, I, I uh, graciously call the Mark one. Uh, it, it, um, it was made by RPI undergrads. Uh, and the, the idea was to build a prototype to kind of like show to people and so that they had a physical thing to look at um, so that they could uh, copy and recreate. 
So, uh, which is the only reason that I have something like that. It wasn't to sell that thing. It was to um, it was to show other people. And the top right is um, is actually we're working with a local artist uh, to make um, an, an AIDS uh, awareness symbol that was culturally specific because the red ribbon that we know of uh, ha really has no cachet right there. Uh, and the bottom is um, uh, a, a, a hospital um, administrator on the right. Uh, named Elena, and uh, on the left is Edward, one of the uh, RIPI undergrad engineers. Um, and this is um, an off the shelf vending machine that, for lots of interesting reasons, was completely inadequate. Uh, and then I have another field site in my hometown of Troy. It's very idyllic. Uh, and there I'm trying to, uh, I'm working with a, uh, an indie media house that's very, very out of like the, the, the mid 80s, like independent media house, like where you know, we show up with a VHS camcorder and just like film you, man, you know, like that. Um, uh, they, 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 have, they make a point of, they say, uh, trying to get one person on their, um, um, uh, on their season that is considered a terrorist. So they, they always try to find someone really provocative. And I've been working with them to create basically like an IP public access television where uh, you can put it, they stream everything that they do in a three camera HD setup. Uh, and it's all on, on YouTube, but they're like, but you know, it can so we can get to someone on the other side of the continent, but it's not getting to someone next door. So, which is a constant problem with the internet, right? It's that you can get to everyone, but if it, but it might not have, you might not get to the people that it, it implicates the most. Um, and so uh, that that is my computer on top of a roof of a hundred year old uh, um, garage, essentially a stable. A, a, a stable um, and I've put up a little antenna, and so we got a half a block of uh, free internet. Uh, and it's powered by um, Commotion Wireless from the New America Foundation, the uh, Open Technology Institute, uh, the founder of which, uh, Sasha Minecraft, likes to call this project um, uh, electronic jaywalking writ large. Uh, the idea being, you know, like very tiny interventions that are kind of illegal such that um, eventually you create a new normal or new reality of what is okay to do. Uh, you know, and so sometimes the internet looks like this, right? You, you know, it, like this makes it look very organized and there's lots of clean lines, but this is the network cabinet that I usually work out of. Um, it's also where they keep the moms. Right, so, uh, so this is you know, generally the kind of the internet that I, that I work with. Uh, and, uh, and the same is true for, for Ghana, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about the messiness um, and the, or at least like the non-linearity that I deal with there in a little while. But it, it brings me to this uh, issue of um, what to bring, and I mean this on multiple levels. So this is what, um, I didn't go to Ghana last summer, but I sent a bunch of undergrads there for the supervision. But, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they went without me, they went with, with some instructions and with uh, everything you see there. And so this is obviously not a vending machine, but it is um, the most difficult to assemble parts of a vending machine. And their, their, their task was to try to build the rest of it with only things that they could find uh, in Ghana. Um, so you can see us trying to like slowly go from build it from, with all the resources you could possibly get at a rich private Western university and try to move to uh, build it from a shop uh, in Kamasa. So uh, part of what to bring on multiple levels is about uh, being useful and being useful to whom, right? So, um, so what, you have to think about what sorts of theories and frameworks you're going to bring to the table and you're going to bring with you um, in understanding your problem. But you, but that also means like, what do you bring in your suitcase, right? Like that's a, a really practical problem, but it's also a really conceptual problem. Um, anyway, and then uh, it also means like when you fit attend a presentation, right? You, know, you have to think of like all the different things that are salient and important in that moment. Um, that also doesn't do violence to your interlocutors in a way that flattens them too much or makes the problem too simple. Because usually when that happens, you, you're really missing some important step, right? So you have to figure out how to keep the complexity uh, correct. Um, and that's, and that, that is a, um, not, just a method, not just a problem of method, but a methodological, like a methodology problem uh, uh, that um, I, I kind of characterize as a sorting paradox. 
because uh, theories should bring order to chaos in some way, or at least make the chaos a little bit more understandable. Um, and tools should make work easier. Uh, but as um, a, a, a professor in my department, Langdon Winter, uh, likes to say, um, it's famous for saying artifacts have politics. You know, it makes uh, politics concrete. You know, if you do something, uh, if you build something with a certain kind of politics in mind, it can uh, constantly reaffirm those politics. It's, um, it's, a, it's one of the ways that the dead still have control over the living. Uh, thanks, Robert Moses. Right? Um, uh, and, and so, and, which also comes down to what works. So what works in the context of, of Ghana doesn't work in the context of RPI and vice versa. So, uh, so I find myself asking, like, you know, like looking at something a lot and being like, okay, I guess it works, but does it work for the people that it's supposed to be um, empowering, right? Because if, it, if I can like, if something goes down, like, you know, I can fix it, that's good that I can fix it, but can they? And can they fix it in a way, and can they care for the system um, in a way that uh, uh, fits with their daily life. Uh, so I, I work in a, in a, um, uh, with a method uh, roughly called critical making um, by Matt Ratto, uh, other prominent writers in this field are Sarah Wiley, who uh, uh, runs um, the, or is a, a founding member of the public labs uh, uh, in open technology and science um, plots uh, uh, collected. They're really, really great. Um, <coughs> And critical making essentially is a, a, trying to find a way to, uh, instead of uh, writing criticism, how can you make artifacts of criticism? How do you build things that make a point? Um, and crit but critical making is usually like making uh, stuff much smaller than the scale of architecture. Um, and it's usually not supposed to make something useful. But I want to make something that is, that is critical and also does uh, pragmatic and useful work. So that's that's my contribution to that field. So I see myself as kind of a praxis broker, uh, somewhat in the style of um, of Isaiah Zagar, who uh, is uh, this artist that um, did some of the mosaic work uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, and he's, he just you know, shows up to a space. Uh, he, he did um, a great outdoor amphitheater in Troy for the, for the, uh, the indie media house that I work with. Um, you know, he just shows up with a bunch of uh, broken tiles um, and, a, and a lot of the equipment, and then just kind of tells people a couple of simple steps of how to put things uh, in the right order to make it look kind of like an Isaiah Zagar. But he's only like he's just brokering and like telling people exactly just kind of what to do in little different spaces. But he's not, um, but he's not doing it himself, and that's the kind of way, kind of the way that I want to work. Uh, and then this is kind of the messiness of, um, that I met in Ghana. And this is, this is answers to the question, how do you get to the nearest pharmacy? And I asked them to draw a map. And this is the, these are the maps that I've uh, yeah, uh, This is very Kevin Lynch kind of you know, image of the city. Um, and then uh, and I'm also creating a, 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 an open source, uh, like a Wikimedia, uh, to post all of the um, uh, vending machine schematics. So these are very clean schematics that I don't know, may or may not, I suspect not be useful, uh, but I'm working on it. And Commotion Wireless does a, this, it does a similar thing, uh, where uh, it looks very, very clean, uh, but uh, again, you saw that, that cabinet, it's not always very clean. Uh, so for, and uh, finally, uh, thanks to the patron, uh, NSF just recently awarded uh, me some money to keep working on the common vet machine, so big thanks to them. Uh, and um, and thank you all for uh, for taking uh, time to hear about that. So thank you.
Um, to help me make sense of what I'm about to say, I, I thought I would just kind of situate myself. So I consider myself a militant researcher practicing a cross-degree <coughs> in anthropology over the same time as autonomy. Um, so real puppets was the question. And uh, so I'm going to take us on a little bit of a genealogical tour. Um, in their work on coming, George Confessus and Sylvia Federici contrast the public, managed by the state for the people, with the noun verb pair of commons and coming, which describes how a specific community is created in the production of relations by which a specific commons are brought into existence and sustained. <laughs> Uh, when we speak of public space, the common sense usage of the term allows it to mean both space managed by the state or the people, as well as the space accessible to and when used by the people, the so called public. So here, this people, the Paul the root of the word republic, too, is considered the public. Uh, it was this, it's this public that was central to the concept of this to the concept of public sphere that even Habermas argued was the key to putting the state in touch with the needs of society through the vehicle of public opinion. For Habermas, this sphere is an area of social life uh, where individuals come together to freely discuss and identify social problems and through discussion influence political action. The public sphere can be seen as a theater in modern societies in which political participation is enacted through the medium of talk. Uh, but as Shayla, Ben Habib, and Nancy Fraser, among others, have argued that Habermas's public hardly represented the people as either a numerical whole or in its diversity. It was exclusive in its class, gender, and its cultural aspects. And from this, uh, this critique came the idea of counter publics, the idea that marginalized groups are excluded from a universal public sphere. And I'll add, there is no universal public sphere. Uh, but that they form their own spheres, which they term subaltern counter publics or counter publics. So I want to stress here that publics are finite. They're made through inclusions and exclusions, and common practices, interests, and projects. So coming back to public space, people can make publics, people can make public space of sorts, but it is also a public or a community we build that comes to be through that effort. A similar idea is the municipalism stressed by Margaret Cohn in her book, The Houses of the People uh, in Interwork Italy. Unlike communalism, she argues, the municipalism she saw in the uh, development of this network of uh, co ops and uh, spaces and activities was created uh, not from an organic unity, but created through a shared history, through a political project. So the shared role of the municipality, she argues, is not passively inherited, but actively recreated the practices of citizenship. This reminds a lot of uh, the argument of Murray Bookchin that the city is an ethical union uh, of citizens, a process involving the social and self-formation of people into active participants in the management of their communities. This should remind a lot of the commons common pair that uh, Federici and Confensis gave us at the start. Of course, we're all aware here that it is not just the ordinary folk, the so called people, folk, Bobu, who take part in defining public space and publics themselves. There are powerful forces related very much to the real economy, uh, particularly the processes of capital accumulation, and we're moving public space in both senses and defining the public in exclusive ways. Rosalind Deutsch shows in her book Evictions how the politics of public art in New York City in the 1980s worked to define homeless outside of the public and therefore unentitled to using quote-unquote public space. In recent work, I also showed how UNESCO's definition of heritage as belonging to all humanity works to redefine the uses and the use value of such sites. In the case of Budapest, the transfer of the downtown area to all mankind has accompanied increasing eviction, and heritage is now used as a reference of anti-homeless laws. 
Um, so I, I agree with Capensis and Federici that the question is how to connect the struggle over the public to those of the Constitution and the Commons. In this moment, when political and economic processes are rolling back to resources of the social state, we must keep fight to keep them, but we must also transform our relationship to them through active relationships with resources. Uh, so here, the stress is on the word active or the idea of participation. So, uh, as the introducer said, I, I worked quite a bit on folk revival movements in Hungary, and um, both myself as well as Shola Olori Bunyomi, um, who was a Phil Akuti in Nigeria, we discovered that, um, that in music dance movements, you can really uh, hierarchize different publics. So, I want to stress here that you can have different types of publics. You can have uh, uh, intimate users of, of dance and music forms. While you may also have a passive set of listeners. So these are both they tend to be referred to as publics of sort, but they're, the stakes are different for these different types of publics. Um, so uh, their relationship to music dance form, as well as their relationship to the public sphere, as well as how they understand the relationship of what they're doing to politics is different in these cases. Um, so, uh, I just want to make a final note um, because we were asked by um, students in the interesting program to come here today on um, some, some thoughts I have about um, space, time, engaging public, specifically in the architectural planet fields that we are in today. Um, so the question at hand for me here is how do what I call real publics relate to the work of architects, urbanists, and urban planners. So public and community engagement have become more and more, sorry, I gave up on my interview. That's a recent work on Hungary. That's Shalal, and then we always work on Philip, too. But you can say that for a while. Um, so um, public and community engagement have become more and more operational categories in the architecture and planning fields and project funding, as we all know. Trained as an anthropologist but teaching urbanists, I recognize important aspects related to spatiality and temporality um, that may work against our understanding of working with real publics, even while we collect credit for public engagement. Um, so teaching methods to urbanists has been an interesting challenge in this way. While I've tried to impart the value of long-term, in-depth fieldwork when we think about what is community or what are publics, um, um, I, I come against the temporality of the field, so not simply the temporality of uh, semester-long projects that students are forced to do, or, or degree-long projects for that matter, but, but also in the architecture planning, very delimited project periods. Um, so, excuse me while I... Get back to my notes. Uh, so, uh, I want to I want to talk about the, the fact that we are um, in, compelled to say that we work with community in order to get funding, in order to get resources of sorts even before we've begun that work. And um, the tension there that we are already saying we're working with community, but at least have yet to, to really work with community in whatever sense we are meaning by that. Um, at least the deeper sense that I'm referring to through this genealogy of publics. Um, so I too have been caught up in this cycle. I don't mean to point fingers at others. Um, we have won a few grants for a project in neighboring uh, Nigeria uh, for something that we're at the moment calling the Hong Kong Solar School Initiative. Um, and um, I, I'm constantly hearing my colleagues say that we work with the community, while in fact we work with a private property owner in a neighborhood, and we are attempting to create relationships that would potentially lead to community control over this project. Um, so we, we do that by incrementally developing the project and workshopping. That's our hope 
to, at this slow process, folks can take over uh, the process of the school. Um, so a final point I just want to make is on spatiality. Um, working with communities often means, to many, um, well actually to people perceived as less fortunate, often in places where we don't actually live. Um, the attention to inequality obviously is noble, and um, we do learn a lot from getting outside of local context. But I think it will be useful to think about how to sustain connections with people in places over time. Um, so I would suggest that whatever work you do far away from home, you also engage at home. A perfect example is um, your work where you're working at home as well as elsewhere. Um, so uh, this is on the Solar School that I was just mentioning. Um, this is Brooklyn Laundry Social School. This is uh, my engagement at home. Um, uh, and so in this project, the idea is to recognize public space, which is not um, held worth by the state for us, but to recognize a space that is public in its access and could be public in its use. So uh, that's just one example of how you can both engage public spaces in certain ways as well and develop new publics, engage publics that exist, and also um, work at home. I'll leave it there since I'm out of time. Um, first, thank you. Uh, my job as moderator here is really just to um, make a few opening comments. Um, this provides me time to think up your questions. Um, but I wanted to begin by uh, thanking the students actually for organizing this event, for all the folks that went into conceptualizing and, and making it happen and bringing together uh, such a great array of speakers. Um, I just wanted to in advance, so the questions I'm going to pose might seem like archaisms, but I'm hoping to ask precisely the question of how certain older questions might uh, come to bear on, on these issues. And um, archaisms marked precisely by my print media here, which I know is kind of wrong. Anyway, yeah, but by thanking you for um, the presentations, which I think have put a lot of questions on the table regarding the state of the public and what it might mean for, for something public or even uh, to constitute a program public, just do some schedules here. Uh, so I think that you were, or your work was being presented today, and um, uh, well, I know that in other contexts, um, uh, does help to complicate questions of public space, and certainly uh, its relationship to technology and to, to, to activism, and raising important stakes regarding what we might call the continuous um, Invention of new forms of participation within and then interventions into democratic processes and um, uh, closure. And so, space uh, and organization, and to some degree, questions uh, of accessibility here emerges as, com as complex sites, I guess, sites um, but also site in a political, informatic, sort of imaginary um, sense, uh, sites which are also necessarily. Stable. So space, another term here um, in scared quotes, becomes one media, say among others, and this is a few of my here, uh, in which techniques of power, of course, operate on subjects to very big ends. And I don't want to suggest that the question um, uh, questions of space are necessarily central to what we can do, or that we reduce what you put on the table. Uh, to the spatial dimensions, but I just want to suggest that space and organization, forms of occupation are emerging as, as crucial factors in articulating the political space. Um, uh, but space also, of course, figures or emerges uh, as a means or vehicle of staging certain forms of resolving the senses. So, to um, so come and post questions out of these uh, some of the terms. I want to begin uh, by asking each of you to uh, comment a little bit further on how, and to how, to what extent you think we can understand something you know, about this question permanently from the invention of the conception of democratic politics 
terms of citizenship, the rights to any questions, through uh, technical revenue questions, to respect, and again, I know we put that on the table that much, to, to really see to what degree um, certain tropes persist and to what degree you think they are going to be challenged. Um, so to ask a question then, whether you're going to take up space, um, appeals also literally to something like an unprioritized real epic real place. So this sort of tension between forging the notions of space and, um, and risking and sort of doing uh, a type of appeal to something. Um, so second, um, in part of how, uh, how your disciplinary homes, which are not part of architecture, but, but engage with these questions of urbanism, um, I wanted to, to get you again to uh, the further on what role aesthetic practices or aesthetic registers play in the work and its conception, the role that representation plays uh, in the political struggles that you address, and you know, the attention to the visual culture, um, uh, the anonymous masking, uh, whether there are tools from you know, even something like a history of you know, where, where the critical terms come to begin to uh, mobilize what the aesthetic is doing. I'm just David, I'm glad you mentioned the collaboration with an artist precisely to try and articulate these symbols for uh, eight centuries in Ghana. And so, again, it's a question of explicitly with an artist. Talking, of course, about the distinction between the interface and the sort of back of house, uh, which has a mean presentation and fair aesthetic distinction. And finally, um, I'm actually about to come to some of the words in Deutsch, but it struck me that your argument, uh, certainly about, uh, about heritage claim by like UNESCO and the forms of exclusion, uh, are, are, are probably very clearly on her reading of the Squares and West Village, etc. And so your term, in some degree, is very quite explicitly on that historical critique. So, so anyway, get to that final comment here. Um, say I was thinking precisely all of us from Deutsch's argument that the interventions in the plane of representation are not simply marginal or tools, but in fact uh, she reads them as direct action in the in the realm of um, from mutual or effective. And, and in this moment, she offers a critique precisely of the discourse of the real in public space, uh, and under the protection of the word public. Some critics return from that problematized, the critical use of the adjective real, real people, real space, real social problems, all presented as the ground of real struggle. Uh, an architecture, of course, too often serves exactly as uh, this type of claim to the real in many discourses. So I don't want to get a sense from you of how we can think about the tension between something like representation, um, marking the possibility of literally of opening up new spaces, new claims, um, in a political sense, and the ways in which, uh, on the other hand, claims to the real have a effect. Summarize that something like asking if you could come on how aesthetic and educational tropes in the visual register play out in your work and whether they're mocking forms of the disjuncture, if you feel, or some of the tools to it, how we're thinking um, about the relationship. And finally, just on the way down here, I have this um, so related question um, coming out of the student's framing. Um, that uh, imposes these questions in another way, which is to say, how does the ghost of the real persist in your work? Does it persist um, uh, in a transformed manner or as a type of object in the contemporary function? Like how, how do we think about um, uh, appeals to the real? Okay. So, the question of space and representation of aesthetics. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and, and I'll um, try to answer the way that at least gestures and a few of your great, great comments. And I really love the phrase, how does the ghost mean real exist? Uh, because one of the things that was um, difficult about writing the book on Anonymous was on the one hand, I had two very uh, different goals. I wanted to amplify the mystique, the aesthetics, the transgression, 
in a sense, I wanted the book to inspire people to become activists. Um, and so I was very much engaging in politics, which wasn't about the sociologically empirical, but on the other hand, because of a lot of the great misinformation around anonymous and also the real stakes of them being kind of tag terrorism, I also was very much compelled by the ghost of the real and to have very, very strong sociological, empirical moments as well. And I was trying to balance the two between between the book and it was always very difficult. But one of the ways that I turned to the sociological, real or empirical is by really pushing against this idea that anonymous is this kind of amorphous blob that just comes into being out of nowhere. And the term amorphous was probably one of the terms used most frequently by journalists. And in fact, it was um, showing the space. And by the space, I mean internet relay chat, IRC, uh, which is where anonymous kind of hung out. Uh, they, they organized themselves. And it is an architecture that's just incredibly important for all gates and hackers, not just anonymous. Uh, but it really helps explain uh, what they did and what was possible and what was not possible. And it was really important for me to return to that sociological real uh, in some ways to stamp out some of the misinformation. But the amplifying mystique was about, you know, the aesthetic dimensions that are so important to anonymous. And all I'll say about that is that I think one of, because you asked about what are the, the terms of engagement when it comes to the aesthetics, one of the things I also find very fascinating about the aesthetics of anonymous is that they're quite populist and they draw from popular culture. And here I'm, I'm you know, referencing V for Vendetta, the film, as well as the graphic novel, which holds such purchase and traction among the paranoid and geeks and hackers, right? But it draws from that world and it's a very populist strain. It's not, you know, vanguard art. It's very identifiable. And that is matched, however, with a elitist strain, which goes to this issue that all publics are not open to all, right? They really are confined by ethos and skill this is a point that I really like about Michael D. Warner's work on counter publics. On the one hand, there's a gesture towards all. They're always kind of contained by ethos and skill. And so you have this melding with the, the kind of leaders on around technological skill, the cultural vocabularies, but a populist strain that really emerges through the kind of embrace of pop culture icons. Um. Uh, I'll tell one, you know, this is um, uh, data with an end of one, but I think it's, a, it's actually more of an anecdote, but I, but I, I, have, I have a sneaking suspicion that um, it, it, it's not just me, is that, um, you know, uh, with these two field sites, I, I used to, you know, write um, grant, grant proposals and fellowship proposals where I would say I'm going to compare these two field sites, one at home and one international, and that was an important Part this you know, geographical distance was the essential part of finding something uh, generalizable um, that to comment on, um, and uh, uh, it was incomprehensible. I'm not saying like, no one understood my work, you know, but, 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 but the, the reviews I got back were that is incomprehensible. Like your your research question doesn't make sense. Uh, you you're not refined enough. And so what I did was I just took out the local um, case study completely. I just said, I'm going to Ghana to make common vending machines, and all of a sudden, money just started like flowing in. It, 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 it's, it, was, it was remarkable that um, anyway, no matter how many times you, know, you want to, like, yeah, I guess, like, cite Edward Soja, right, or, uh, um, or, uh, or Iris Mary Younger, or, or even David Harvey, um, it, it, the, um, you know, the historic, you know, if I were to say, like, I'm historicized, you know, like, there's a problem that's historicized. That has a genealogy in time, then that's very like, oh, okay, that's a research question. Like, there's this long lineage that you can work on. But if I say no, that there's actually something contemporary that is happening in different places, and I want to study that, um, that it might also have a historical dimension. Edward Sojourn says that there's like a, 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 di a dialectic, a, tri a tri dialectic, right? Uh, you know, it's a social, historical, and, and geographical. I think I got that right. Um, uh, you know, like, uh, um, but, but that still doesn't penetrate, even when I would like um, apply to uh, 
really interdisciplinary fellowships that were like uh, humanities, art, social science, and architecture. Uh, it was just not readable or legible. Um, so, I, and so I, I think that it's just like kind of really rubber meets the road uh, issue here, where um, they, that kind of work can barely get funded because it, it's still, for, for some reason, it's this really sticky problem uh, that it, it doesn't it doesn't quite read as as um, as focused research. Um, and, and, and I think in terms of the, the aesthetics, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll say real quick that I think the, um, the decision of the New America Foundation uh, to do like this, like um, to brand very specifically this open source project um, is it, a good idea um, because it makes it a little bit more approachable. Because it, it, it's like in the same way that anonymous does something a little bit different where, they're, where they say, you know, like, you know, this is supposed to it, like frustrate you or make you angry in some way, or they use pop culture references to make it very legible. Um, uh, the, the, you know, like the, the New America Foundation wanted to kind of make it look branded and nice. You know, I, I think that kind of aesthetics uh, works in that case, but like when I'm working with this artist, uh, nothing has quite stuck yet. And I think that's mostly because I have nothing to add to that equation. Right? Like I, it, it was just where I come in as a broker where I can say, this thing is happening, you as an artist, that uh, he does a, a thing for stamping, um, you know, like you can come in and do this if you have any cool, interesting ideas, but really beyond like introducing you to this project, I, I don't think I can really do anything for you then, right? So I, I, um, uh, I, I, I think I got all of it. So I think that's, yeah. 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 yeah, oh, sure. The first step of trying to uh, uh, reconcile with us how you think the relationship between your uh, citation of the uh, the other case community, you quote, you know, tribute to Carl Rove, which is a uh, fantastic um, <laughs> moment in, uh, in the desublimation of the public strategy you know, during the Bush regime. And, um, and the fact that artifacts have politics. I'm just wondering, um, but I guess my, my first thought would be something like um, you know, images and politics is supposed to be true. You know, uh, is there, I mean, in, in the claim that artifacts have politics, is there, is there, is there uh, associated with that a claim that somehow <laughs> the material intervention uh, can adequately counter something like Rose's claim to operating within the, you know, like, the industry of claims to value and stuff? I'm just okay. trying to get yeah. a sense of, um, again, you know, sort of keeping my finger out for things that, that are, that have, have a potential nostalgia and also that nostalgia is a sort of knowing one. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so one, one interesting uh, um, twist here is right, so that uh, like Lightning Learner's um, essay, uh, one of the bigger examples is of um, the uh, uh, Long Island Expressway. Anyone heard of the Long Island Expressway? No. Um, uh, uh, well, it, um, he, he, and he says that you know, uh, uh, Robert does is make bridges too low so that buses couldn't get to Jones Beach, which was supposed to be for white suburbanites, and the buses would keep the you know, uh, people that weren't white suburbanites you know, away from Jones Beach. Um, and, but that's actually not true. That it's not like, you know, like that, the bridge, you know, like there are, there's a bus station at Jones Beach, right? Like, so, but, but, um, uh, the, a follow-up paper uh, said that, you know, that example still makes sense because we can already think of lots of different things that, um, where something like a bridge would very physically stop some kind of, some people from doing a certain thing that would then uh, um, create uh, a space that is exclusive, right? So we can think of lots of different good examples for that. And so, that, so in that way, it's kind of an urban legend. That um, that is not quite true, but you, you know it has a moral. You learn some things from it, and it feels real. Um, so I think like you don't even really have to construct something, but you can say that there is something out there that is built that looks that sounds real. Um, and, and so, but but to get specifically to your question of like, can you build something to counteract uh, uh, Bush foreign policy? Right? Um, uh, you know, like that. Um, Right, yeah, and, and, right, and, right, right, a level of cosmology, right? There's, um, uh, yeah, I, it, it's, um, sometimes it, it may be a little dangerous to, to give an answer to that 
get it all on campus because it seems like um, that part of the answer might might you know, like might lie in the underlying um, uh, 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 decisions that lead to acts of terrorism. Honestly, you know, or, or ISIS. You know, like that. Uh, you know, that everyone acts so like surprised that like ISIS has really great video. You know, it's like, uh, well, why not? Like, of course they do. You know, what? Why? Like, how could you expect to win a, a war at that at that scale without great PR? You know, like really without great media. Um, that is um, that is so essential. Um, so you know, uh, um, I think a lot of us might might want to like the thing that counteracts American imperialism because we don't we're not really too keen on American imperialism. But you know, but we don't also necessarily have to like the the alternative to that either. Like that can also be bad, and that that is one like active and uh, unfortunately pretty um, uh, effective. You know, uh, Um, okay, so um, you picked down sort of thing by mentioning um, forms of occupation space that we don't have to use. Um, and as it relates to permanent labor redefinition of politics. Um, so, I guess the first thing I would want to say is that spatial arrangements, and I'm kind of adding to that note um, here, and artifacts as well reflect the political and economic processes and relationships that we are embedded in. So um, the question of space, when you look around this neighborhood and around for a decade or um, three or four, we'll notice massive transformations in the space in which we are. So um, so you know, certainly the occupation of space is, is a it's at hand, right? It's going to be occupied in one way or another. So I guess that would be my you know my first note. Um, but I, I when we get to the question of this aesthetic Registers. I guess I'd like to, you know, remind us all that the aesthetic is not just a sort of visual representation. Right? That the aesthetic is understood, you know, since you know by the European men of the 18th century um, was in fact the sensed sphere, right? It's 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 the the thing that's sensed through the body. And so if we think of the aesthetic in that broader sense, we're not just talking about representation or even just visual representation, but um, but the body and space. Um, so I guess I would um, want to stress, at least in my own work and the things that I'm looking at, I'm very interested in um, the question of the ethical aesthetic, right? But it's a question of the social relations and the felt environment, right? Which also includes relationship to the built environment and spatial arrangements, um, and how that relates to sensibilities, right? So, so your good friend and co, of course, he's talked about the work of the self on the self, right? Um, if we think about Wunchen or um, some of the other people who mentioned my presentation, we're talking about a dialectical relationship, right, in, in something like those research, where there's a relationship um, and through that relationship is uh, a change of the self as an ethical being as well as a physical being. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I, I respond in a very different way to question aesthetics, but of course that would mean that that work on art um, or even formless architectural um, discourse would be interesting to me in the sense that it engages the aesthetic, although it often captures itself in um, so I think um, you had mentioned specifically heritage. Um, I'm forgetting now what it was that. When you go to the UNESCO declaration, um, um, right? Um, it struck me that in your remarks about exclusion, the exclusion constituted by by uh, declaring that the topic of the whole world or humanity that is uh, you know, the fear of exclusion of just a few people. And struck me that that was very much a parallel to some of Joyce's oh, claims. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I guess I was asking you if know, it wasn't already a kind of claim from um, within our history at play. And the, Yes, in that sense, right. It, it is very much like I, in my work on that, I refer to George because I think she does that so well. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so then I guess I'll just quick comment on the ghost of the real. Um, I I think you know of the three of us, a lot of the things that I'm working on have less cyber <laughs> aspects to it, so there's less ghost there in that sense, right? But um, but I am interested in the real spatial and social implications of both what I look at as well as what I do. And I guess that is something. Um, that I see, um, you know, I see a lot of similarity with David's work with what I'm doing, but um, there's a distinction that I would draw, at least from the way you presented it, um, which is that you said that, you know, you, I'll often misquote you because I don't remember the exact terms, so correct me if I get it wrong, but that your interest is to involve yourself, right, to kind of uh, give a certain set of skills or, um, an apparatus, let's say, and then uh, extract yourself from the space and let the apparatus become that of others. Um, and I guess I see my role slightly differently because I see that an essential aspect of what I'm doing is the production of solidarity between myself and those other actors <coughs> in a kind of expanding web, which has some similarities to these guys that we each are both um, been thinking about. So, um, but to me, that is a, a materialized um, space of relationship. So, let's open up to more interest. I don't know if there's a microphone circulating or. Space of the chat um, was seen almost as more of a real space, and that this public was seen more as a real community rather than as an activist laboratory where things were cooked up and um, localized within a real space, within an urban space um, to protest. So, I mean, I guess my question is um, if I have a question, um, you know, if you Notice these different attitudes amongst these groups as they continue to fragment. Um, and if you, if you wanted to come on them, their attitudes toward um, space and their attitudes toward the ways that they create objects that um, engender different types of actions. Okay. Well, um, for those that may not know, anonymous is really odd uh, because. It was never meant to become an activist public. Um, Anonymous was a name used almost exclusively for a very fierce form of internet pranking um, that exists, you know, across the internet, but was really accentuated on this very, very anonymous image board where the parameters of the image board, the fact that everyone posts anonymously, um, kind of lent itself towards extremities in terms of you know speech, humor, offensiveness. Um, but they became activists. And it's kind of a fascinating question. You know, how is it that a, a kind of entity, not really a group of people who in some ways were engaged in I wouldn't say anti-political because totally has its own politics, but certainly anti-activist um, sensibility became activist, right? And that's a really important question to entertain in a lot of ways because activists have to be made, right? Um, you can't just assume that they're going to come into being in a lot of ways. 
And I think that there's two elements um, that really contributed to that in a lot of ways. And one was this accidental fact that they decided to protest the Church of Scientology on the streets. Um, and it's a kind of long story as to how that came into being. But there was one day where 7,000 geeks and hackers showed up in 127 cities um, to protest the Church of Scientology. And it was the affective experience of being on the streets, uh, the, the media validation that kind of helped awaken that sensibility uh, in a lot of ways. And brought into motion the fact that anonymous could be used for activism. And that's somewhat accidental at some level, but I think the, the experience of being on the street really mattered. That said, one of the other surprising elements is that later in the history of anonymous, a different network, a different node came into being that never met in person. And they really embraced digital direct action. They started hacking and engaging in distributed denial of service attacks. It also came into being somewhat accidentally. But I do wonder whether they could have gone on that activist path uh, without the name having to be refigured for activism. So they didn't need to meet in person. In fact, they couldn't meet in person because they were breaking the law left and right in, in pretty serious ways. Uh, but by, by the time they came into being, which was around the fall of 2010, the name at least was being used for that purpose and had also been, and this is really crucial, to question the public, the name anonymous is commons. Anyone can take it, right? And it's why you have such weird uh, figurations with the name white is spread. There are limits to what the name is used for. ISIS probably can't take the name anonymous. Um, they could try, but it might not work. But nevertheless, it does function as a commons. But the, the street moment was particularly important in that kind of metamorphosis from Pearson trolls to activists. Yeah, just um, um, come back to that point. I just uh, really appreciate the, the structural and the kinds of the, um, the figure of anonymous when we presented it as multiplicity, but being something like a projection screen for uh, a type of endless set of commutation. I mean, this is really fascinating. But when I, um, I'm going to make a connection here, but one of the, the Things that interest me when one thinks about these, um, the, the sort of gradual shift in the, the discourses around online and communities and, uh, and strategies of what happened in, like, I'm going to be very good historian here, but, but uh, in something around the RNC protests in New York, where people like Jason and Eli were really like swarm technologies to you know, bring bodies together as strategic actions. And, and this radical shift from a type of utopia of online um, communications and forums and anti-social rhetoric to, um, to a, a very different, like, more heterogeneous understanding of our technology and bodies and, uh, and space and space sort of how they begin to work together. And this is certainly um, this is, uh, informing my digital bodies alliance text, um, a reflection of the large popular. The, the sort of coming into public uh, um, undocumented Mexican workers in Los Angeles as a protest, we also treaded a similarly difficult line in terms of claims, the sort of political claims they could make by entering into um, uh, the space of the city at the end of the city. So, this, this is sort of what I was trying to get a sense of you know, this really interesting um, um, relation between you know, claims. About digital technologies and claims of some absolute material realm, and how you begin to think of one interrupting the other, or, or how sort of and people in space between them is precisely where you can begin to find traction for certain forms of action and operating in a slightly more complex um, uh, model than either a smooth digital space or as a physical material space. Very quiet, I didn't say anything.
Yeah, I mean, I have a question about the, the reaction to your text from, from anonymous, if there was one. Uh, only, I'm trying to think through the, the way you figure them as actively refusing, not only the appropriation of their identities in the service of a, uh, entertainment economy, um, but also the, the way you really show us that uh, figures are participants who would claim some kind of celebrity or singular status were equally refused. And so I'm not, I'm not asking whether you as an author with a singular authorial identity um, have been refused by them, but I, I am interested if there's a kind of model of writing that you saw emerging from the comics in which a collective narrative of their mission that would reveal some of the internal ambiguities and conflicts with their eyes. And it, it, because it would seem that your book then would necessarily be in dialogue with this imaginary other form of writing. I, I just, I'm just wondering if it exists and whether that is in fact legible in your project. Right, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, interestingly enough, some similar phenomenon to Anonymous is something like the group Blissett, which was a name that was invented by Italian activists um, and then was taken uh, by many different authors and pranksters. And some of the folks who invented it and also took it on was the Blooming Collective, who had authored collective books such as Q, you know what I mean? Which is really an important uh, form of collective authorship. And, um, you know, in the world of Anonymous, which functions similarly to something like Luther Blissett, um, uh, I can't say that there has been something that is as coherent as something like Hugh or the history of Anonymous, but there is a tremendous amount of writing that occurs with manifestos and scenes and messages on pastebin. And then the question will become, I think in the future, will, will someone try to kind of collect this all together? Because I do think that collective representation does represent in some ways, and we are going for real, the kind of heart and soul of anonymous in a way that my book is very, very much, you know, one perspective. And, you know, generally people did like it, uh, but in part because I reminded everyone that this was not the story of anonymous, that there were many other stories. Um, and in the end, I think that they just appreciated it because it was such a pain in the butt to put together. Um, and also, as you noted, I mean, they, they still are very much into celebrity. It's just the collective celebrity. And so my, my book kind of furthers that cause. And you know, you've written some about this, right? So in, in some ways, I have no problems with it. But, but it will be interesting. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the future they did figure out a way to kind of tell their collective history through this collective means. In some ways, they have certainly produced a lot of material to contribute to that project. I have a question about the book on the movie and the social part, which I um, don't know much about, but I, I guess I was just initially wondering if it was in any way related to the like Ten Margaret's project at the Queen's Museum, or, or, or I mean, if it has programming, or how, how you think about it as a form of, you know, uh, activism, who it's funded through, and I, Question. Um, um, but it has it has funding potential through social practice art, yeah. you know, for sure. Um, but it, uh, um, although it um, utilizes uh, aesthetic means, its goal is not to make art. Um, we're never sure. Um, well, in fact, we're about to have a gallery show. <laughs> Um, on May 3rd, I don't think it's coming to it, but um, that has more to do with its aspects as a military research project um, through which over the, we began to this in 2012, over the last few years we've um, really reflected the difficulties of being able to do the types of activities we like to do, which does involve programming of sorts, uh, um, in these spaces run by small business owners and children 
owner is a very specific guy who goes to the people that um, which uh, has meant that the, the, the although we find the spatial arrangement of the laundry mat very interesting, but not so easy to display in one laundry mat that we have a relationship with. Um, some of the artifacts of the processes we've been engaging in, which um, are, uh, you can see here, uh, a kind of mapping game that we uh, use to engage conversation about uh, bedside, where this is, where the project takes place. Um, but that said, it, uh, the, the, the research aspect of it has led to our conclusion that the type of work that we're interested in doing, which is transformational rather than representational, you could say, um, is because it's so difficult to do in um, the spaces as such, but yet has given us a lot of information about the role of small businesses like Bonjumas in a transforming city like New York, where in Manhattan, in fact, the stats are showing Bonjumas are disappearing. Um, uh, are, it, it has in fact led us to a very different space. And so, one of the reasons for the gallery show is to also curate a bunch of conversations that won't be watching that, but instead the gallery about um, the possibility of cooperativizing laundry maps. So, that's, that's labor has come in in a different formation than it did before. Yeah, okay, I'm getting, oh, I have one question for Manuel, and then we'll go so uh, one really interesting aspect in which they all connect with the patients is um, that they're really working with the determinacy of the kind of method um, as a kind of inchoate foundation to the projects and to the intention as well. Um, it's somehow ambiguity, obfuscation, um, challenging of limits, the liminality is the point, right? That uh, somehow projects are about tracking which is alive and doing things um, in, in bounds that are not very clear. And that's particularly productive because it challenges the established categories or uh, other projects. Um, so, however, I wanted to ask as well, it's going to intervene, right? You still have to keep this up somehow when you do that. Um, how do you, there's one aspect of that which is the temporality, but how do you? Uh, yourselves in a way design your engagement to uh, according to the temporality, for example, funding is mentioned with one, which you have to work very actively in, which is focusing on temporality. Uh, otherwise, publishing is both temporality. Um, and I guess the point of that is to ask whether um, is there a need for some kind of resolution? Is there a point that you have to call this an event? That's something I know just a kind of stream of consciousness. What is the productivity of an intention in the irresolute dimension of the project and what it's trying to do? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I'm going to answer maybe in a tangential way, but hopefully in a productive way, because in some ways, um, you know. My book is very much about anonymous, and one may ask, well, what lessons beyond anonymous might there be in the book? And I care very deeply about politics, actually, and I think there's a lot of lessons. And it has to do a little bit with the question of the stealth or stealthy. And I do think we're in a very interesting moment uh, politically, and it's not very new, actually, uh, where one has to be very stealthy to accomplish certain things. Um, being a little bit vague, but I'll be very concrete now. I think of something like strike debt, right, where um, folks from Occupy are being very, very pragmatic with uh, politics where they're really trying to get the American public to learn about um, the condition <coughs> of uh, university debt. And it's a bunch of radicals, and they're very radical, but they're being very stealthy uh, by engaging with sometimes more liberal language or liberal players uh, for the purposes of achieving a goal. And I think that's really important. I think we have a lot to learn uh, using that method of what I call stealthiness, where there's a kind of radical politics, but often 
um, a non-radical veneer at certain moments or partnerships for the purposes of achieving a wider goal. I think Anonymous actually achieved that in its own weird way by staying away from explicit radical language, even though some moments are very radical, but their language is very ambiguous and inchoate at moments, and it allows people to kind of turn to them because they focus in on the speak um, and the pop culture elements and the hacks. So I think there is where there's some lessons, even though there's some real dangers in engaging in that stealthy politics. Um, uh, I, I would also add the, uh, that you look at the, um, the kinds of affordances that are in a lot of uh, popular social media, the uh, two essays. Um, I keep referring, coming up to uh, this, this issue, uh, two issues in the new inquiry, or two articles in the new inquiry about uh, um, voting and then anonymity as, like, um, as, as uh, reoccurring affordances of technologies. Um, and it's interesting to just look at like what um, parts of sociality are, are built into systems and then what is just kind of left to the users, right? And uh, we typically think of anonymity reading all of these different kinds of um, actions and, and particular modes of interacting, but voting also does that too, you know, and reinforces the kind of majoritarian uh, act, acting a lot. And so, uh, you know, uh, to, to go back to, to your point specifically, you know, I think um, uh, part of like finding the place to start writing is um, is is also like looking at like well, uh, is doing that really classic like I guess it's, maybe it's a lot dated, but well, not like the '90s uh, social construction technology thing. It's like you know it could have been otherwise, and just just play a little mind game with yourself and be like, what historically could have these technologies done instead, and then, but then why it, did we get what we got? Right. So like, that's that's usually what I, what I try to I try to get out of it. Right. Because, because typically if if you it, 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 Starting to think of a technology that doesn't use anonymity, uh, ephemerality, um, uh, and, uh, and voting, and a couple other handful of things, you know, like likes, um, you know, it, 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 they're all, they're kind of hard to conceive of because they're so useful. It's the water that was swimming. So, like, you know, we don't really know like what other kinds of networks would would arise that would do something very radically. So I'm reminded of David's, uh, you were speaking about professor viewers, I think uh, we were inspired by, um, and you were talking about how important it is to have policy. And this, if you remember the list of things, yeah. you know, politics, you know, yeah, I, so I, yeah, yeah, yes, language, language, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying then. But I looked at the medical library, you were talking about methods, and you were talking about how having a politic. Maybe I'm just not I agree with that. But I will go back to that uh, because I think that the by um, understanding um, at least the processes that I understand as of nature as stream of consciousness, what is missed is is the politics of it, right? So these are experiments, but they're not just open experiments, whatever happens, right? There, there are particular interests at heart. That doesn't mean that they succeed in, in, in their intentions, but they're experiments about what, what can happen under these circumstances. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I wanted to reframe that in the sense that, that um, I think everyone here agrees with that. In that sense, and, and to get back to the question of stealth, I and, and to think that you said earlier actually about empiricism is that you can hold a, a kind of empiricist research in one hand and a militant research in another. I don't think that um, militant research should preclude empiricist research. I mean, certainly, question is real, but we should. Um, but it's useful to know, let's say, when I'm working with that side. Uh, what the foreclosure rates are, right? That's those, those are real numbers. <laughs> they're changing numbers, but they're real numbers, um, which is very different than to um, to be engaged in a co-production of knowledge with people who may or may not know that statistic. Um, so, so I want to say that that I, 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 I value both of those forms of knowledge production, and I think that they're useful to each other. Um, 
So um, getting back to you know, the question of funding and sustainability, um, I do think that the, the question of skills is at hand, but it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you may be obscuring your political intentions and the radicality of your bigger picture, but you can also produce empirical research that is useful to whomever or you know, useful, useful products that are valuable to a funder. Um, although you may not want to if it contradicts that politics, that's the question that we have to have. So just um, want to thank us because, again, we're going to actually move straight to the next panel and then there's a coffee break, I think, between the second and third panel. So thank you all. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, so for our second panel of the day, uh, real time 
we'll focus up on relations between time and reality. And how reality is constructed through, with, and within time. By speculating on real time, we will hope to address the contemporary and the status of the real. Through the historical attempts to classify and narrate times, relying on objective and subjective notions of reality, and start thinking on how does the forming of histories and projections of future realities engage with the present. In a reality where past, present, and future merge together. Given the immediacy of our present reality, we ask today how do its multiple constructions play out in our perception of real time. Uh, joining us today for the time panel, we have uh, Timothy Barker, lecturer in digital media in the School of Culture of Creative Arts at the University of Glasgow, author of Time and the Digital, a book which introduces the topic of multi temporal media and develops a process-oriented philosophy of time and digital culture. Timothy has published and spoken widely on the philosophy of time and media in materialism, in media theory, questions of technology, and creativity on histories on experimental art and cinema. His current interests lie in theories of contemporary and technical media studies, exploring the phenomenological repercussions of experiences of time produced by micro temporalities of computational hardware, involving an exploration of the engineering of media system through the Chinese experiences of what he calls contemporary life. Next, we have uh, welcome, Tim. Um, next, we have Maria Costima, current professor of contemporary culture studies at the University of Chishkaj, Jivashvila, Finland, where he directs the research center for contemporary culture. Brian conducts his research in the fields of digital astrology, programmable media, and game studies. He has published widely around the issues of digital literature, game studies, <coughs> and narratology, and his writings have been translated into several languages. He is the co founder and co director of Cybertex Yearbook, member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Digital Culture and Electronic Tourism. The Literary Advisory Board of the Electronic Literature Organization and the Review Board of King's Science. His current research projects include good education and the emergency of political culture and transmedia literacy and international comparative study, while writing a book on time and temporality in digital culture. Um, welcome, Riley. Uh, next. We have a famed architectural writer and theorist Sam Quinter, current professor at the University of Angevan Kunst in Vienna and the Park Institute GNUD in New York. Previously, he has held academic positions at Rice University and Harvard University PSD. He uh, is very interested in the topic of perception, understood as a different completeness of a different kind of reality, explored from a neuro ecological and neuro aesthetic point of view. He introduces experimental practice as fundamental in the art, architecture, and aesthetics sustained that the experimentation of the, and the production of knowledge are several conditions that shape reality. He is the founder of Song Books and the author of books, uh, Architectures of Time, Towards the Theory of the Event in Modernist Culture, Far from Equilibrium, Essays on Technology and Design Culture, and Breaking for the City and the End of the, at the, end of the Millennium. Welcome, uh, Sanford. And uh, as our moderator, we have Mark Masuda, director <laughs> of exhibitions and co director of and co director of the program in critical curatorial and conceptual practices in architecture at GISA, receiving of several recent grants, he has curated and co curated and produced numerous exhibitions. He is the co editor and co author of Dan Grant in New Jersey. Me has recent articles published in numerous publications. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time and flying all the way to take part of our discussion. So, thank you for your time. Um, I'm just going to change this slide because you've been looking at that uh, 
A little bit of um, uh, for me, like, when, when I wrote um, the book Time and Digital, um, I kind of saw that most discussions of the kind of relationship between the, the virtual and actual in the Deleuzean sense in digital media studies were, were, were based around concepts of space. Um, now, my reading of Deleuze was that it was a virtual actual was actually a temporal um, concept. And I said to us, why were there more um, considerations of uh, digital uh, time as a kind of virtual type of time in contact with the kind of actualities of the present? Um, and thinking about this kind of multi time um, present, Digital um, led me to um, Michel Serres and, um, and his descriptions of multi temporality. So, this is how, how um, Serres describes multi temporality to, to, to Matur, and um, quite famous book Conversations on the Science of Multi Time. Um, in this kind of short presentation, what I want to do is, is, is use this kind of thinking about time to look at a couple of artworks that give form to multi-temporality and then end briefly by thinking about multi-temporality and a wider digital culture and focusing mainly on YouTube and that kind of archiving of events on YouTube. And then um, try and think about um, some recent theories of contemporaneity and the conditions of so, in, in, in Sarah's description of the, the late model car, we see an image of, of presentness constituted by a drawing together of what he terms the plinths of time. In essence, this is a multi-temporal assemblage taking form in the present. The object that is the late model car that he's speaking about here emerges from an aggregate of, of, of solutions from different periods in history. In other words, the aggregate of solutions is the grounding from which the present object becomes. What, what is important to Sarah is, is not, is not the, 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 the materiality of the late model car per se, it's a kind of object, but rather, rather the processes that this object and this materiality embodies, and the way that the object draws together one's disparate moments in time into a field of modern temporality. For Ceres, that the object or the image, whether this be a car, a book, a thought, or a memory, and likewise every moment in time is always multi temporal, or he uses the word polychrome. Like the late model car, it's always made up of an aggregate of solutions, concepts, or problems originating from different historical eras. Ceres uses um, this concept of multi temporality to, to, to do it. To do a philosophy um, where events are always kind of rooted in much older ways of doing things in much more archaic practices. So he tries to understand the contemporary by trying to think how the archaic is folded into the contemporary. Um, so multi temporal time is, is a time based on kind of scales, scaling type of time. It has a, a, a quantity thick with, with these multiple temporal episodes overlaid in, in, the, in the present. So a kind of thickened thick duration <coughs> of the kind of words or, or, or birds and stuff. Okay, so to move to kind of actual examples of this happening, I, I, um, I want to look at a work, um, Janet Carter's work, The Long with Black Hair, which is getting a, a, a little bit old now, but I, I chose this mainly because we're in New York, and I thought it would be interesting to talk about. Um, but also because it demonstrates this kind of multi-temporality really in a really quite nice, elegant way for me, and then to use it to think about kind of digital works. So, it, so in the work, basically, it's a, it's a, um, a, a, a kind of participatory walk, uh, walk around Central Park. You put on some headphones, and part of leads you through Central Park, pointing out lands, um, landmarks, and, and kind of tell these quite kind of esoteric story 
um, at the beginning of the experience, you're asked to synchronize your footsteps to other <coughs> footsteps, and there's this kind of, uh, again, a synchronization between the kind of past that Cardiff was traversing and, and the present that you're moving through the same space at different times. You kind of hear dogs barking in the distance, you hear the open ear conversations, um, uh, you have what I would suggest is kind of two levels of temporality, the, the, the kind of your movements in the present, and then um, um, this kind of representation through through the headphones. So what's at stake in the, in the multi-temporality composed by Kyber is the way histories, both personal and collectives, collectives, <coughs> sorry, are in constant contact with our experiences of the present moment. The work shows us that signs of the past are in fact never entirely of the past, but always in contact with the present. So this is a kind of way to think about data and things like that. Um, so as with the kind of increasing store of data digitally stored, um, Carter's voiceover relates to a past act of entering data into a recording medium. But the, the sign of this act, the audio replayed through the headphones, <coughs> is not necessarily a sign of the past, it's rather a sign of the way this past affects the passing present. So in, in difference and repetition, Deleuze tells us that a scar is not the sign of the past wound, but of the present fact of having been wounded. That the scar is in the present, I, I, can, I can see it on my, on my thumb. And it's a sign of the present's relationship to the past. The past is not represented by the, the scar, which happened when I cut myself broken wine glass, but, 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 but the past is a condition for the sign, virtually present in the sign. I would suggest some kind of aftermath. A, a different example um, is a video installation. <coughs> I think I've done something wrong. <laughs> So just click. So a different example of such an overlay of temporality is that it is a video installation by the Australian artist Dennis Dolphara. Um, in this work called Magnificent Light, um, Del Favaro sets up a, a, a two-channel installation on, on, on one screen, which is a large uh, cinema screen, is played a um, series of memory images, and it appears to be a kind of series of erotic images with a voiceover, um, um, focusing on the kind of present moment and kind of repeating all that matters you and I in this moment, this moment of strangeness. And it's not until the end of, of this video that you kind of see this image and it's, and, and, and it's understood that this is actually um, a narrative of Adam kind of, of, of Graf and this is the, um, the, the, the female soldiers perspective on events. The, the other screen is a, a small screen buried inside a plinth in the middle of the room and only one person can look at this plinth uh, inside the plinth at one time and put on headphones and you hear the narrative of the um, the prisoner's experience, who, unlike the soldier who focuses on the present, um, it, it focuses on the past and memories. Um, and the, the works at its most effective, or I found it at its most effective, when that audio in the headphones pauses and you hear that the dominant audio that's filling the space actually it's still infiltrating that personal narrative. So this, so this is a work that presents, again, these kind of two models, uh, 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 two, two experiences of um, temporality, one public, one, one, one private, um, one that can be accessed by everyone, one that can be accessed by a few. So these kinds of things that these artworks give form to, that, they, that these artworks experiment with, can also be seen to be playing out 
in, 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 a, in a more kind of widespread level on things like um, the, the documentation, uh, sorry, the archiving of citizen journalism on YouTube, um, which as, I mean, the, the media philosopher Dylan Flusser would suggest that this is a post-historical media and it's um, an archive that, that um, um, stores the kind of aftermath of events and builds relationships between events, not necessarily in a linear sense, but based on the kind of algorithm and the, and the titles and tags and the videos that you afterwards. This, this, this footage, this is the foot, um, a still from the footage of Gaddafi being murdered, in, um, as has been argued by um, Joanna Sumiala, is actually an image of sacrifice. It's a, it's a ritualistic image, but as different from um, traditional sacrifices, this is a sacrifice that's distrib distributed in time and space. A, a, a drastic new temporality is given to this kind of historically traditional um, practice. So, in, in all of this stuff, um, what I'm trying to do and trying to think through in my kind of more recent work is thinking about the, 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 the technical underpinnings for what art historians and theorists such as Terry Smith and um, German theorist Boris Broy is called the condition of contemporaneity. Okay, so, so from its etymology, point, the, the contemporary points to a particular togetherness with time. But it's more than just a kind of mindless up-to-datedness. It's actually a kind of melancholic and quite anachronistic experience. So Smith and Groys focus on a kind of large-scale historical events. What I'm interested in is, is, is to look to the kind of technical underpinnings for this experience of being both in time, this kind of citizen journalism, draws you closer to these events, but also out of time, as the kind of the YouTube platform draws you simultaneously into its own technicity. So these are the types of temporality I'm interested in, both in time and out of time. Thank you. Senseless procession of events in nature 
within an external thinkable space of measure, management, and mastery. So the Bergsonian and possibly even Heideggerian resonance is clearly unmistakable in those words in the paragraph. But more importantly, we recognize the assertion of the deforming action of technical processes on how the universe is not only organized, but presented to and grasped by the imagination. In sum, what we're routinely referred to in the decades in which those lines were written, as some of you will recognize these terms, as epistemological apparatus or conditions of possibility of knowledge, are taking on new portrayals today and meeting new conceptual challenges, largely in response to a set of developments that many like to gather under the dynamic rubric of post fortist social organization. But specifically, there is a threefold development that theory is today only barely managing to grasp, if indeed it really grasps it at all and which does not yield adequately to the original Foucauldian or Kantian formulations. The obvious first one is digitization, whose latter phases, I've talked about the phases of the last 10 or 15 years, have largely exceeded the initial impacts of automation and control of mechanical processes by effectively forming an entire sensorium concrete experience, one incidentally that we cannot legitimately not call real. The second has to do with the supplanting of standard what I call command operations, where a first gesture triggers an effect or process in another within a syntactic chain with finite sphere of influence to the present and the current model everybody knows, and I hope some of us rue the model of communication with its simultaneously nebular modalities and tyrannical imperatives, in many ways that refer very simply to the compulsion to communicate, which characterizes virtually every <coughs> calorie of energy we spend um, in life today. And it's a moral imperative as well as everything else. And third, is the emergence of a new domain of what Foucault used to call positivities that have to do with the neuro-political and neurobiological bases of experience. In sum, the physical substrate within which the collective and individual assembly of subjectivity is accomplished. But some refer to with a shorthand term as the brain which is widely accepted today to seamlessly include both the body and the environmental surround. We can call this the expanded cognitive realm. I share the personal concern of conference organizers, and I really mean personal, beyond the obvious ethical, social, and cultural dimensions that we're all sensitive here to free to discuss today in the manner in which we were also sort of educated to do that. Um, we rarely break uh, <coughs> tone to acknowledge the savageness, the cruelty of what is being done to us you know, by intellectualizing it. Um, so I share the concern regarding the historical developments that we are experiencing and all too willingly accommodating today with the abstraction processes that are removing our nervous systems from the natural milieus within which they were evolved and the exquisite, the exquisite cost of such wholesale removal. In a way, I suppose that's what I would refer to as the real, the real, which is the real, real, let's say, or the real that we uh, collectively uh, contract uh, to understand when we, when we 
Yet, for the sake of pure academic formalism, I would suggest that for reasons of technical and philosophical hygiene, the facile assumption of enduring value in the opposition of mediated versus real is probably inadequate. I would propose that almost all of the most powerful analytical projects of recent decades, many of which in fact you were referring to um, uh, in your uh, talk, those that made claim to materialism as a central principle invariably ascribed reality to both the content of experience as well as to the forces that shape it. As a first principle, I would argue, there is no reason to abandon it. And it was always a topic of incredulity to me that you could talk about the so-called real as if it were something that was suddenly <laughs> a, a distinct entity, um, separable from uh, the world experience. It is accurate, however, I say this for rhetorical reasons, and also maybe to acknowledge the important problem of the conference. It's accurate to treat mediation as an impoverishment and restriction of a field of relationships of far richer and more open possibility. But it is also useful to be reminded that the related term, disintermediation, describes the same reduction of human possibility and freedom when it refers to the channeling of social relations into narrow pathways of interaction, as it would be social media or the online shopping. That's where the term comes from. It's the term from economic theory in the 1990s. Um, where these relations are said to be far more efficiently or far more efficient precisely because they have removed the rich layers of mediating middleness, the thick domain of random, complex, freely unfolding intermediate factors and contexts from social transactions. The point is in that unbearably long complicated sentence is simply that mediation is very often a source of real, uh, uh, let's say, uh, satisfying richness in our, in our experience. That's to say that the term doesn't really offer a universal value, if you like, uh, at least on the moral register. It is simple, and it is a platitude. To suggest that the rationalizing, I mean, it's a good plan. I want to say what I'm about to say is a good plan. Uh, that it's a plan to, su to suggest that the rationalization processes that have continued to optimize human energy and effort, and in so doing, to deform our lives, are real. At the same time, as they exhibit fierce hostility to the natural, uh, to the spontaneous processes of becoming, as they exist, as they can be remembered in both the external, natural, and physical world, as well as within our own bodies and nervous systems. The agonism of our era is still no other than the struggle for sovereignty over time itself. But the field in which its drama is played out and shifted, or perhaps only expanded, thanks to the refinements of a pan post fortist society, or at least the expansive elements thereof. Today, however, it plays out through the production of experience. Yet within both the physical substrate of our brains themselves and in the functional modalities that populate what is increasingly referred to as the cognitive realm, we know that the brain and the world are inseparable resultants of each's actions on the other. The real is an emergent feature in this ancient but ever mutating handshake. And that it is this handshake that has become the site of innovation for design and social action. It's really in that handshake 
that most of what's happening is happening today. Some refer to this development as a third phase in modern economic and technical history. I refer to it as sometimes as cognitive capitalism. Although for my own part, I seriously doubt that capitalism properly captures the scope of what is at stake. I prefer to cast the problem in still more archaic terms, <coughs> and I'm enormously grateful for the application of the archaic, the archaic component of virtually every, every object of every relation um, that takes place around us. Incredible amnesia that has led us to forget that that is the case. I prefer to cast the problem in still more archaic terms as a central problem of ecology. What I like to call ecology is sort of a game to try and increasingly radicalize and deepen, maybe in some ways to expand the scope of that term, as a new domain of thought and action in which politics and biology. That, in a sense, is my cover term for time, biology and time, in which politics and biology no longer remain separate. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, the other organizer for the invitation. I'll try to use my time wisely. So I will start my sort of introduction to the temporality of digital fiction. So that's my focus here on digital fiction. By looking at uh, what we may mean with the notion of real time in this context. <coughs> First, in computing, which is the basis of all digital fictions. Real time, historically, was used to make distinction to the then prevailing practice of batch processing. Instead of waiting for a number of computing tasks to be filed in the form of times of cards before running them all in a row, the alternative was to operate the computer directly via an interactive screen and see the results appear immediately. In digital gaming, there is a similar distinction between real-time and turn-based, as in real-time strategy games versus turn-based strategy games. In the latter case, nothing matters as long as you are pondering your own move, and the enemy can only take action after you have completed your own turn. In contrast to this, real-time strategy games are much more stressing, as the opponent ceaselessly advances his goals. And if you are too slow to make decisions, you may all be too late. From these examples, we can draw the conclusion that real time indicates something instantaneous, constantly at flux, remorselessly taking away and not waiting for the lane. Another theory to real time comes through contrasting it to fiction. Real time, in this case, uh, is the time of the world. It, it is measured by clocks and chronometers. And its uh, physical basis is in entropy, the cranial decay of all structures, following the one way only arrow of time. In this case, the rigid and unforgiving real time is contrasting with the fictional time, which may take any form we can imagine. In fiction, time is elastic and may be molded any which way. It's flexible and gentle, allowing us to prolong good moments and remake bad decisions. The 
these little frictions are peculiar in the way how they combine narration. Uh, Premium color the rows we can inverse ourselves in and characters we can identify with. Uh, and simulations, narration and simulation, which enables the highly precise and flexible procedural manipulation of the set fictional rows. And it is here, I believe, where all the reasons to consider technology open up. Before showing you an example of what I'm talking about, however, a few concepts should be presented. First, uh, historian Bernard uh, Froyel formulated the influential categorization of the three temporal levels. Geographical time comprising millennia of the slow formation of mountains, seas, and such. And then the time of social and cultural history is counted in centuries and generations. And finally, the time of the daily events counted in seconds, minutes, not until months and years. In our digital era, however, it is not enough. The frequencies of mega and gigahertz of our silicon processors require the fourth, le fourth level micro temporality. Events designed by us but taking place under the radar of human senses and perception. It is this micro time, the sheer speed of processors, which enables the temporal preciseness and flexibility of the cell. Another well-known concept here is Henrik uh, Erbson's duration, which he distinguishes from the measurable scientific time as something which can only be experienced and crafted through intuition. As powerful and convincing, uh, convincing as this distinction is, I believe it does not hold, at least not to time. Examination of digital time teaches us how temporal measures are but fabrications, and even the scientific understanding of time undergoes constant uh, reformulation. The, the micro time, on its turn, undermines persons distinction in a, in a number of The measurable, the fully quantified digital micro time gives rise to the engaging experiences of simulated worlds. The experience itself may still be personal and intuitive, but it is conditioned and manipulated through the expressive processing of digital technology. Now, uh, as an example, I'd like to this one, discuss one specific work, uh, Screen by Noah Waterproof. So, Screen has been made for the cave virtual reality environment at Crown University. In this case, uh, three walls and the floor function as displays and create a virtual space within which the user physically moves with goggles on her eyes and the pointer in her hand. And now we can possibly uh, check the video of the work two minutes. <coughs> so, uh, first, uh, just something like uh, 20 seconds. And then, then. Okay, there's a voice on the front. Yes, So maybe there are times that we feel we can almost reach out and touch them. Okay, so of course this is just a video of a virtual reality, so being there in the middle of the 3D virtual textual world would be quite different. We do uh, what we can to push them bit by bit back in the <laughs> Fingernails tap with the plastic face of her alarm clock. It's boxy numbers telling her the time of another continent. So, the first stop 
feeling away, the reader can mark the words back using the pointer. Reaches, project, back, of, deep, cafe, paper, pastries, cakes, under, blues. And finally, all collapse is done. We stare into the white void of lost memories, a loose scatter about us of what fragments remain. No sense of nonsense to be found there. <coughs> this year, uh, the temporal aspect of the reading act itself becomes significant. The movement of the words in the shaded space places a constraint on the reading, so that the time spent reading certain words or phrases uh, comes in a concrete way. The real reading time, as, con as contrasted with the fictional time of the story, is constantly foregrounded to act with bodily engagement in the textual world, very much like in playing digital games. In screen, we are facing the constant balancing and tension between chaos and order, movement towards order or entropy. The fragmentation and disappearance of, of memories is presented not only in the content of the narrative discourse, but also in the form of this world. In a way of, way of dream logic, the deterioration of memories is taken out of the sphere of intuition and made visible and touchable. Simply put, screen is placing us in a situation where we are very concretely fighting against time and forgetting. From our everyday life, we can recognize this struggle in the occasional experiences of the liminal state, right after waking up, when the dream is quickly vanishing from the memory, and we are desperately trying to hold on to the dream before it fully evaporates. Compared to the phenomena such as the universe, life, or dream, screen differs in one main aspect, which is its nature as a deterministic system. As such, it is able to bring along a closer the work ends in chaos, where the sentences and words lose their legible content and they become one undifferentiated mass. This is as close as we can get to the experience in the end of time. The price uh, for having sorry, uh, the price for having the privilege of that rare experience is that the reader has to step out of time. The split between real time and fictional time becomes occurring as the fictional world collapses, leaving the reader to stand outside. The peculiarity of digital fiction lies in their dynamic nature. The dynamics in its turn is based on computer code executed by microprocessors. As computing devices have evolved into an expressive medium, the digital fictions may combine the flexibility and preciseness of digital simulations with the potential of psychologically engaging media narratives. This in itself opens up a new field of experimenting with temporal and dynamic media contents, but also changes our habitual ways to engage with media and the world in general. They foreground our implicit notions of the flow and direction of time, in making time reversible or manipulatable in various other ways. The fictional time is intertwined with the user's real time in complex and intricate ways. In cases such as screen, the real time seems to be dominating over the fictional time of some extent. This situation, however, enables a more relaxed experience of fictional time. It can be tweaked in many ways, as long as a minimum amount of coherence is maintained. But this kind of lexical notion of time is transferred back to the real life experience. It may result in the timeless time of the information networks, as Manuel Castells has described it. As there is blending of several temporal modalities, it might be more accurate, however, 
the Kuwait trucks are multiple time or multi ten uh, eight times. Within this multiplicity, the real time is rendered as one alternative among others. And if it is to gain a privileged position, that position must come out of something that may resist the micro time of digital technology to anchoring in the Karelian longer than one side. So, um, I'd like to thank the, the organizers and um, our speakers. So, uh, I have a series of comments and questions, which um, uh, I'll try to uh, uh, aim to work on uh, some of the comments of our speakers in a moment. But the the one commonality among the various presentations that maybe we will come back to is um, the strange confluence of real and time within uh, each of the projects and what would constitute, let's say, the, the temporality or the time proper to um, a kind of historical moment. Because if we were to take center seriously, the people have been talking about time for quite a while. Time itself would appear here as a curious anachronism. Um, and, and, and so I'll begin by referring to the ghost that has been much discussed already today, which is the, the ghost of the real that the organizers of the exhibition have already identified in the brief that was discussed in the previous panel. Because I would say that the notion of the ghost of real points to the paradoxes that the symposium seemed to want to discuss. As, as we know, ghosts appear from some other time, and so comments itself here a few minutes ago. They are the embodiment or the non-embodiment of a disjointed temporality, and uh, quite literally an anachrony. That in Derrida's famous formulation of ontology, they have their form of being in non-being. And so the ghost here as the real, not just the real, but the real time, also registers time as folded into the spectral logic of non-medias, meaning that the ghost of the real call up here carries with it, not just archaisms and anachronisms, but the uh, invalidity structure of the world. Um, so to be haunted by the real and real time, we need already to understand the real as a spectral effect. And so I bring up this ghost of the real to, to point to the way that it seems to fall in that logic already suggests the complication of temporality, real time, as, as a kind of ghost of motion, already undoes the unity of its present time, let's say. And, and the reason I start there is because I'm, I'm hoping that I can prod the speakers to position their own comments on time and real time in relation to the discussion from the last panel, where the notion of the real public seemed to give way to notions of multiple publics uh, 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 with uh, not only multiple sets of information and multiple uh, technologies of interaction, uh, but that in its in their multiplicities, those publics would perform politically and socially. And so I'm wondering in this structure of multiple time that seems to be suggested in um, each of your projects in different ways, how do you associate that multiplicity in relation to just like the multiple publics, uh, uh, real public discussion? Um, the, and then we'll come back to this question, but there will be many ways to do this, which is to say this more simply, what, what is the value of our contemporary understanding of the, uh, tempor uh, the multiple temporality of, um, of the projects and conditions that we're discussing? 
No, I'm not. Okay, so let's go. No, no. <laughs> that, that is easy, yes. That is easy. <laughs> so to think about that, to come back to this question about what makes time now um, um, current, I was wondering what within real time could be framed as a contemporary problem as the students have done on, on their own ways. But the phrase that came up often in thinking about this was the military term near real time, which is the term that the uh, American military uses and the international military forces use to describe the effect of manipulating drone strikes and drone information gathering long distance through the mediation space of the Al Ubaid Air Base in Qatar, in which Images from drones are uh, transmitted via satellite to the base and then fed back to America by high quantum people. And so the effect is one of being able to operate the drones from extreme long distances. But what if but the term near real time registers then is not only the capacity of operating in almost real time, but all of the implicit delays that are embedded within those technologies of communication. And, and the near real time seems to register not only the incredible efficacy of those uh, uh, military actions, but also all of the extreme formulations of technical apparatuses, social apparatuses that allow us to take place, as well as all Potential resistance in each of those moments. And so, another general question is how, in each of your projects, the brain of the technologies of computation or all of the conditions of the post war economy, for example, Sanford, are conditioned by a temporary <coughs> mechanism of temporality. Not only other things play out in a technical sense, but how does that, how does the reading of the technical help you think about the uh, theoretical position of time and time? Nicholas, right there. Yeah. 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 Um, so what's special about digital time um, as opposed to, to the way many theorists and philosophers have written about time previously? I would suggest that it is something to do with the analytical nature of digital media. <coughs> so the, the purpose of digital media is to separate things small fragments to analyze them. Okay. Whereas older media, uh, TV, cinema, you can talk about it in terms of the synthesis, you know, of, 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 of a flow, a flow in a brain of the space, a flow of TV program, all the kind of um, um, cinema theory of the time, all the kind of words. Digital time is, is different for that, but because of um, Ray's kind of micro-temporality, there's very small parcels and, and, and segments. So, so I think that that's, that's the difference, and I think that's why there's this resurgence of, of thinking about this time on this micro-scale. And the, the, I mean, the major theorists in this area is um, Wolfgang Ernst um, from Humboldt, um, who um, has a um, fantastic book that's um, um, Translated by UC Korea called um, um, Digital Memory in the Archive, where it talks about this very small kind of micro, micro events. What's at stake in the delay? It's constant delay of the present and the constant of making near real time, real, making real time near real time rather than real time. Um, in terms of thinking about real time and the kind of the ghost of the real, um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm a media theorist, so I kind of think just think about alleviation and temporality, the kind of production of, of, of temporality. Um, and the kind of the multiple times that are produced as they're mediated, I would suggest, are just as real as this kind of real time which we have a kind of term for, but don't actually understand. And I mean, if I go back to my roots, which is Whitehead, and suggest you want to want to I think one of my favorite quotes of Whitehead is something about that the, ray, the rays of the sun are just as real to a scientist who, who describes them in these kind of ontological terms as they are to someone who watches it and has this kind of experience. And that's what I'd argue about real time. Real time isn't just that thing that can be measured by a clock, it's, it's, it's that thing that's experienced as this kind of virtual kind of temporality is folded into the, into the present moment. Um, okay, but one more. What, what, is the, kind of, what is the value of this analysis? What, what, why, why am I interested in thinking about time? Um, I think it's, it's to do with those last two slides that I've showed you. I think it's important to, 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 to think about these questions of history and, and post-history and actually to begin conducting a kind of discourse analysis of the technology of that's representing historical events. So YouTube is an archive of, kind of, 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 of citizen journalism. What's, how does that um, um, condition, support, restrict um, discourses of history? Yeah, on, on, a, on a technical level. Um, that's all I've written down. So that's all I can remember. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I could I pick up on that. So, uh, so first of all, the, 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 the speed of the, the processors of the microphone time uh, conceals this uh, transistor constant in the flow. So even though there are all processes taking place, uh, still we can see something taking place as a, as a medium flow. So, so the, the processes are, are concealed because they take place so, so quickly. And uh, this relates to this uh, near real time operations as well. It's, uh, we, we are easily thinking uh, about this. This is real since we are seeing it almost real time. And, and at the same time, there, there are several layers of mediation taking place, and it's, it's, it's manipulated. Uh, and, and, but it's easy to forget the manipulation because it appears as. Uh, another aspect which is uh, which is important here is to look at uh, uh, digital time in a sense of objective time, so for even even great time. Uh, and of course, Facebook is more than uh, time as, as a resource, but time can be money or whatever. But I think that it makes a kind of new, new kind of uh, sense here that uh, we can really we can really do money for it. It's a resource that, that, that can, be, can be divided, can be molded, can be distributed in many, many ways. And, and this is something that is for, for every game player, computer game player, is, is very, very obvious at the time. It's, 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 it's something that we are playing with. And, and uh, this is to me. Positions much more than I wish I had. I want to say I found it absolutely fascinating the uh, virtuosity which you uh, employed. Uh, a whole series of ideas by time, which were for me absolutely were more than ideas by time, but were more language by time uh, in relation to emerging realities, uh, specifically. Game, the video game modality, the digital on screen, the video game modality, and it's various times. But we are really losing track of some essential distinctions that were in play and have no reason to put out the play yet. Person's idea of real time, whether you agree with it or not, came down to a very rigorous pivot, and that was something that is divisible and something that is not. 
Now, when the divisions take place, they are done because there are, let's say, there's value to be read from them. They are able to be redeployed in certain ways. And I would suggest that one of the major re redeployments is a general training, if you like, or um, well, a way for the production of efficient personnel in the ongoing conduct of our society. And I think video game is a very interesting place because there are certainly areas of great instability which have in fact produced perhaps real forms of temporal new subjectivity which are associated with the forms of time. But for the most part, that's not what you describe. They convinced me that that is what was going on in the places where you described them to uh, be happening. It reminded me of the moment in uh, Benjamin's book on the Pope Blair where he, um, remember it was, uh, the, I think, wait a minute, where he talks about a camera. He talks about it as a, as a press sort of completely subsumed, the workers subsumed, if you like, inseparably in this temporal, productive, and energetic regime. And what he could discover in the act of gambling through this kind of profligate wasting of his energy, if you like, and the value, the accumulation of energy in terms of wages, etc., etc., simply by throwing the dice and risking it all on a, on a single instant of chance. It strikes me that in a sense that what he was arguing is that there was something very, very radical and notable about that. That use of the instinct of the way was re-engagement, maybe a re-experiencing of the physical intensity, if you like, of real time. I think that that's not what you can describe it. And I have to say, at the same time, uh, I would wonder, if you can answer something that says, that we know that the video game modality is becoming the dominant sort of structuring device um, for all of social transactions, whether it's you know, in the market, or just you know, interactions among people and friends, etc. Um, I'm wondering to the, rich, to the degree to which you are not, in fact, sort of supplying the infrastructure of an ecology processes that are going on. I mean, even though I know you could go on that, I'm just wondering, in a certain sense, you're also, you know, you're recovering a lot of the, 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 the routines. They're actually root, not routines of the modality. Now, I would also say that, you know, you invoke something which I thought, you know, I love teaching this essay course, course, the thing that's called time-based time art, is that what it's called? You don't know it. Comrades of time. Comrades of time, yeah. Which, in fact, is brilliant, extremely beautiful, and lifeless in the art and essay. Until the end, when you realize the Heideggerian mysticism comes back, and you realize it's an apology for the hidden state of affairs in which we live, that kind of throwing away what's hope, basically saying, you really have today only to surrender to the poverty of the instant that is given. So, uh, so we got the, one thing I can say, but you know, I'll talk about the uh, little bastard in the room. Um, the political project of time is not doing very well. <coughs> curious thing, though, given that where we ended with these actors was through these forests. Uh, those sorts of developments that you that you identified so so clearly again that's part of what I was trying to get at how is how is time or the formulation of real time helpful for us to think these these post fortis developments you articulated are they are they those time levels of conceptual epistemological category helping anyone or do we just mean that this is the time that we're in so, so that's part of what I'm trying to ask here it's not it's how each of you takes uh, the condition of time in each of your own analysis and, and, and refracts it 
in, in relationship to some of the, not just technical, technical evolution, but new um, applications of uh, understanding the cognition and computation. Is there, is there a way in each of your projects that you reposition time temporality within uh, the social concept? Is that, is that even possible? And this is this is why I alluded to the to the ghost of the real. Obviously, when Derek Dunn is talking about Spectre, he's talking about the Spectre of Marx and what the perpetual haunting by uh, the Marxist project means for him in the 1920s, when he's writing this text, but also for uh, cohort uh, um, um, so, so, so maybe Sandra, you could say something about that, and we can put you down. Or if not that, then maybe the question of how the ecological and the biological comes together. No, that's uh, the same thing. Okay. So uh, very simply, the, the invocation, let's say, of the cultural and technical regime, I guess, that we call it, not cultural, but it's cultural, but of economic and technical regime that people refer to when they talk about post uh, fordism is really simply kind of hand waving argument um, through which we can recognize um, that the systems of rationality within which we live are extremely material, even if not absolutely visible, and that they are real, right? And in a sense, it's kind of an argument for materialism. By extension, of course, it's the idea that if that is real, um, in fact, also everything else is real. The point, though, is that we are shaped and formed, like, in a, in a condition of absolute non separability, if you like, from the formation of our technical, political, familial, etc. world. But the thing is, is that for the figures who are able to actually see that is not just a relationship of causality, but a, um, you know, I don't know, right now I'm not finding the language to express it, but a, uh, an imminent co-creation, um, um, I think it's a necessary, I mean, that is, that is the only condition in which one can talk about the multiplicity of times that we're, that we're looking at here. It is only if there are no essential um, between the organization of experience, the organization of the world, the organization of energy, the organization of production. So, and I agree with these guys who are doing their work. These are married very intimately to everything we know about the physical world, such as the entropy, um, the disorders. Um, and that's why, let's say, for a different generation of thought, the as the second half of the 20th century we produced the sort of rationalists <coughs> the and the uh, and, and many many of the other, uh, other novels. Um, these were or Smithson, for example, I think it was fascinating. I thought that was channel of Smithson. No, no, wait, it was your video. The one where you kind of well, obviously you see I have a cognitive <laughs> problem with the digital media myself. I don't remember who's what. Yeah, the words. Yeah, the words. Uh, that was okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, okay. I you. What was your? What was the video that you showed? Did you show? The Andrew. The Andrew McLean. What was the Andrew McLean? I thought it was sounding in the voiceover. Smith was the one who asserted that you like just the way that the concrete. Uh, physical aspect of language. Maybe we'll see if there are any questions from the audience. Well, uh, there, is a, there is a historical relationship between time and space, and we're talking about different types of time for this vision. For so, uh, but if, uh, if we are uh, talking about different uh, kind of time, probably we are uh, in conditions to, to say the same about 
uh, space. And I want to I wanna ask you uh, what are, uh, which are the implications of this uh, new assortment of those buildings, for, for instance, for, uh, for the architects of people who are in the business of space. And this sort of thing. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, uh, well, time and space are intertwined. You can't, you can't take them apart. Uh, and, uh, uh, just looking at the uh, digital media, it, it, it seems that for for some reason, uh, space is more obvious in many ways. So that uh, people are uh, paying much more attention to. to if you somehow uh, make, make, a, make the, the space uh, changes in there, that, that's, that's something that people, people notice immediately. But, but nobody pays attention if the temporal scale is changed, for example. So, uh, so it, it seems that the space is, is, is more, it, it's more apparent and more obvious. And uh, time is something that we, that we are not looking at. If we are not conscious of trying to somehow pay attention. So uh, that, that, that's what, what again, one of the games is that people that gain space uh, is, is, is always closely tied to the kind of temporality. But that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's main that we know this space. But that, that's something that, that we should learn, I think, that, that is a true manipulation of space we can also have. It seems to me, implicitly, what you can invoke, if nothing else, uh, the work of Tom um, Hunt. That's something that you can uh, I refer in a way to his distinction when you ask, uh, well, first of all, his incredible work on play, uh, but the distinction that he draws when you speak to the child, asking him, is that something you made up or is that something you found in the world? Uh, in which the whole idea of play is such that the child doesn't have to answer that question. Three combined elements from the real world. And it is in that sense, this place he says is the place we go to, the laps, the place where we go to, that's the place where we live. For those of us who are lucky occasionally to live there, um, then it's in play. So I wonder where this essential temporality of play goes in the video game. Because we know that that's what drives you to the console. The question is, is whether it yields that, or whether it's just a predator prey. It's a place or this special place that we might possible. I think in, in most cases it's, it's something that kind of doing the, the, the play every day somehow the yields. It, it's something that it's part of the emergency. Experience. It's not. It's not usually so. Uh, what you are especially looking for. People are when asked, they are, they are looking for for, for fun, for relaxation. No, not so. But they, they are not going there to to, to prolong time, to make time to stop. Even though that is uh, that is something that then may may emerge. <laughs> So I wanted to return to uh, something that Tanya mentioned, uh, uh, kind of move um, uh, away from the notion of capitalism or at least some kind of distance, some kind of preference. Um, I want to return to that as a problem in a way. Um, the notion of postmodernism is a notion of the right? um, And um, you mentioned also. Uh, one of the aspects that is one of the 
phenomenological aspects of the thing you described is this imperative to be. So putting those things together, uh, it seems to me that somehow that imperative is connected. Uh, and at the same time, then how can we think about this without really thinking about uh, spaces that are not those forest, that are purely forest? And uh, here, there's no reason not to think about forces. Forces have not gone away. I, mean, I know there's some years of the past, but what has is, in fact, I would say, everything's Timothy, the uh, fact that we no longer have as part of our general. Intellectual attitudes to assume that there are these multiple layers of the right and unfoldings, and even things that are far, far back into our kid times and our kid practices and our kid structures. You know, one of the most important things also that we need to realize is that even though those structures no longer exist, they still operate. Um, why we have regional differences. Um, one even goes so far these days to demonstrate that uh, the human brain, even though we like to say that it's essentially universal, more or less the same in all people, uh, it is radically different for us to say the whole point of natural selection and the very complicated processes of, uh, of developmental uh, neurobiology such that the, great, the purpose of it is in fact to make completely regionally specific things. Um, so I agree with everything we've heard today is that it is a need um, to think much less one dimensional. Um, but post fordism by no means suggests that we now have feudal structures all previous ones operating simultaneously embedded in uh, uh, Now, it's precisely that type of analysis that we require more. Not the facile shibboleths or the facile uh, you know, constructs that well, I was thinking no one could talk about when we refer to the social reality right now. Concern. I'm arguing that we need to take our biological substrate. But I, I also want to do that from a concern for the production of conduct and food subjectivities. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you have reflections on this question of temporality as related to, you know, both, let's say, the subjectivity of an investor, the conduct of an investor, as well as those people for whom the effects of that disaggregated set of time relationships that draws upon space relationships. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and yeah, I think that is that, that kind of that idea of timing and who has access to this kind of timing. Who can time things on that kind of micro level and have these um, algorithms written to kind of trade in this kind of very, very short period of time that, that most people can't conceptualize, let alone operate kind of within. So, yeah, that, so there is that kind of. Um, uh, very political, um, economic kind of imperative to thinking about how these different scales of time and different experiences of time have a rehearsive kind of power relationship. So yeah, I agree, I agree completely. Um, I did hear a paper from someone on this recently, but I can't remember. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you remember that Uh, so I, 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 All right, 
thanks very much um, for having a great day.
Thank you. 
Before we start, I would like to introduce you then. Heather Esterlin is an architect, writer, and professor at Yale University. She has also taught at Parsons, practicing at the Yale University. Her research deals with issues of globalization and some of its most important architectural, urban, and political consequences. She has published various books and articles that include subtraction, enduring innocence, global architecture, and its political mastery and organization space, landscape, highways, and houses in America. In her, in her most recent book, Extra State Craft, The Power of Infrastructure Space, she examines global infrastructure network as a medium of policy in three global infrastructure platforms, the free zone, broadband in East Africa, and highest quality management. Her work has also been exhibited as a storefront for urban architecture in New York, the Rotterdam Biennale, Venice Biennale, and architectural in New York. David Harvey is a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the City University of New York. He's author of various books, articles, and lectures that include A Companion to Mars Capital, Links Capital, The Name of Capital and the Crisis of Capitalism, and Social Justice and the City. Professor Harvey's work and teaching has been the point of departure of abundant research on the economic and social forces that shape our contemporary city. In his last book, 70 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism, he explores the inner conflicts of capital in a similar world, opening stimulating spaces for change in our present economic system. Saskia Sassen is a Robert Lean Professor of Sociology and Chair at the Committee of Global Product at the University. Her research and writing focuses on globalization, including social, economic, and political dimensions, immigration, global cities, and mutual and the new technologies, and changes within the liberal state that result from poor transnational conditions. Her books that are translated into over 20 languages include expulsion, Explosions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy, Territory Authority, Rights from Medieval to Global Assemblage, and Sociology of Globalization or Cities in a World Economy. She is a recipient of diverse hours and mentions, running from multiple doctoral honoris causa to main lectures and insulated for various economies. Most recently, she was awarded the Wikipedia uh, Asturias Prize in Social Science and uh, was also made a member of the Royal Academy of Science of the Netherlands. Manuel Spalzer is an architect and researcher, co founder of the Art Architecture Collaborative Country and Another. He has also worked among others for OMA, OMA, Baroque Vega, and Dalit Architects. 
the scholarly work focuses on the inter intersection between architecture, technology, finance, and the law. He has published and exhibited his work international and has taught at various institutions, including Colards and the University of Southern California. <coughs> Manuel is currently a candidate in the PhD and Architecture program and a graduate fellow of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Social Board at the University. Thank you for your coming. So I was recently I was embarrassed to discover that I had actually used the word real um, in title. Um, <laughs> what's a slang form? So I guess it was okay. It's not, not quite the same real that mistakenly associates practicality with the determination of a fixed or nameable condition. Uh, or the real but mistakenly associates political productivity with the determination of what is right and true. In another uh, uh, Colombian conversation a couple of weeks ago that Saskia and I were on, I, I showed evidence of some of the real economies that I've studied, I'll share with you. Nothing is as real as diamonds. Nothing is as real as diamonds. Diamond Paris attracts magically, fascinates inside and out its simulated architecture. The inner design of the palace transforms the image and emotion of the diamond onto the visitor, letting them become a part of the myth of the diamond. Or if you prefer something grounded and philosophical, <laughs> you Lead forward to the Gilded Coast. Many of free trade sound is receiving every day the world reads from the Atlantic. The German philosopher Hegel once said, the breeze from the ocean is the call of trade. So, the breeze blowing over like a free trade sound is sending you a warm and faithful invitation for investment and trade. Please accept this warm invitation and call. Go to Nike for investment. Go to Nike for development. Let us join hands in cooperation to create a beautiful tomorrow. So those are the sort of puffy, soft-focused fairy tales promoting the <coughs> urban paradigms like the Z Zone that over the last 30 years have become a primary template for thousands of world cities. They're the vessels of what I call kind of extra statecraft, where a nation and its new partners selectively refortify themselves and in favor of some of their citizens and not others. Um, perfect island of corporate externalizing. Uh, the zone is a place of stealthy politics and labor abuse and environmental abuse. And it's a secret weapon of some of the most powerful players on earth. Sometimes a secret that even seems best kept from those of us who are trained to make space. So, so however unlikely it may seem, I'm trying to argue that this space potentially brings to our art another relevance and another aesthetic repertoire with fortified political capacity. It's not enough to report on it. Um, it's not enough to name it. Um, in a recent book, Extra State, with the title that's a picture, I've been working on developing a, a different habit of mind for encountering this space. So, working on unfocusing eyes to see not only buildings with shapes and outlines, but also the almost infrastructural matrix space in which buildings are suspended. Not, not an infrastructure of pipes and wires under the ground, but something like an operating system for shaping the city. And precisely because it's a moment when we're focused on the ubiquity and also the political treachery of digital information systems, it's also looking for a mind that can see space as itself an information system. As Gregory Bateson said, you know, a man, a tree, and an axe is an information system. So the operate, this operating system is currently coded by the World Men of Marketplace, by World Bank Yes Men, by 28-year-old McKinsey consultants, by quality management specialists. Um, and I'm asking, what, what if we 
actually know how to hack it with the spatial equivalent of a software? What, what if we're even good at making not only object form, we're really good at that, um, but form in another gear or register, an active form or interplay that's manif that manifests in the heavy bulk of urban space. Um, and it's an interplay you know, that, that, that doesn't, doesn't need sensors or apps or smart cities to, to, to make architecture advance. And what if the more formulaic this matrix space, the more difficult it sometimes is to design a meaningful object form, but it might be easier to design an active form, to leverage some of the existing multipliers and switches in the matrix with amplifying effects that can reverse or condition or manipulate without playing along. Um, an effect that, begin, that can begin with spatial variables that are underexploited in, in global politics. It seems that, um, this is my slide, and, and it seems that exploiting the power of active form seems to, again, require another habit of mind. And, Think about philosophy, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, what he would have called the difference between knowing that and knowing how. Correct answers, knowledge conjured through a single executive decision, are all things that involve knowing how. Um, maybe sorry, knowing that. Um, uh, so then the vestigial enlightenment mind loves knowledge that's exercised in language, math, and optical evidence, and even our sophisticated digital technologies sometimes make the old modern mind glow and throb. Um, and despite its protestations, that mind is often a religious mind that loves the one, that loves binaries, or the one and the many, but, but rarely just the many. For Ryle, it was a subject of some sport that, that knowing that was treated as somehow more real by the Enlightenment mind, while knowing how, you know, that was Knowledge reliant on an unfolding interplay in time um, was treated as a kind of occult, a kind of limbo world, kind of blur of unknowable disposition rather than an identifiable event. For instance, you know, knowing how, you can't know the right answer to being funny. You can only know how to be funny. But it's only another real. And, and, and ironically, this, this supposedly occult knowledge of knowing how is often the, the real of the most practical actions that we do. It's a habit of mind that exceeds intellectual. It's capable of working through changing, unfinished processes for which there can only be dynamic markers. Um, but the markers are dynamic and indeterminate to be practical, although that sounds contradictory. So one, one can, for instance, only know how to navigate a river by observing all the ripples and dimples that are changing on the surface. One can only know how to correlate card combinations in poker against the changing faces of the, of the players. You can only know how to feel for the potentials of bread in dough, or um, land a plane in high wind, or sling plaster, or hustle or kiss, or tell a joke. And the aesthetic pleasures are different. They, they have to do with population effects, and, and with those active forms, one's working not with a single object, but with a stream of objects, by setting up a multiplier, or a switch, or an interplay. <laughs> it's to, with a nod to the previous panel, it's time-released form. I can't, I can't talk about knowing how in 10 minutes, but, 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 but architects who know how are hyper aware of multiple levers and faders in, in urban space. Um, they might think of changing a street by increasing the number of times a train stops there. They might change suburban morphology by designing a detail that becomes contagious within a population of identical houses. Or rather than a master plan, for a city, they would design a growth protocol uh, that, that, puts a, that makes a counterbalancing calculus of something like public and private space. Um, they adjust, they might adjust the capacities of an entire highway network by changing, by altering the repertoire of one switch within it. They might even know how to not only put the development machine into forward, but put it into reverse. 
this is what you've been looking at as a, a subtraction protocol that I've been working on that's reliant on an interplay between properties. So it's not sort of one property that we're so, so fiercely attached to, but an interplay to, that we can relieve distended suburbs or retreat from floodplains or, or sensitive landscapes. So I don't know if we could later on if you wanted to push the more button on this, but this is about um, retreating from, from um, uh, from floodplains. Um, so it's a mind that's like that of a chess player that can see many moves ahead, except that the game can't be rationalized in all the ways that we seem so fond of rationalizing and making universals in our discipline, whether from cybernetics and behaviors and take your choice. In, in this world, I would say confidence games trump game theory. And any hustler or comedian, or now I'll add activist, knows that amongst stealthy political players, you need more than righteous declaration and cast iron logics and truths. There are times to stand up and give a name, um, but in a world where there are stealthy political actors, where those stealthy political actors rely on undeclared politics, it's not enough to know what to oppose. You need to know how, knowing how, to oppose it. So like a confidence man, a spatial political activist knows how to use discrepancy, irrationality, fiction, and obfuscation to deliberately craft a seductive cultural story or persuasion that has explicit spatial consequences. Um, and I'm a fellow traveler with, with Manuel, the creation of urban faction. Um, or like the comedian who learned to tell jokes to keep his parents from fighting the architect who knows how might even know how to deftly deploy a spatial variable to reduce the violence of binaries or dissipate monistic concentrations of authority. To be able to manipulate the, the, imminent, the violence or productivity that's imminent in spatial arrangement. So finally, if infrastructure space is, is, a, is in infrastructure space it's routine to deal with the irrational, the discrepant, and the indeterminate, not only because it's more practical, but also more vigilant than righteousness. With active forms of interplay, a snaking chain of moves, maybe a snaking chain of moves, can worm into matrix space and gradually generate leverage against intractable politics. Infrastructure, this in kind of infrastructure space may be the secret weapon of the powerful, but, but two can play at this game. Thank you. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank Maite for the nice uh, titles, you know, what is real? I mean, real is a very ambiguous word, it's clearly a provocation. And uh, let me flatten real into materialities, and there is a lot of that. That kind of real, there is a lot of. What I want to emphasize is that the organizing dynamic that which has the power to make the new ordering uses all that materiality. And it is astounding to what extent it can use very elementary and simple, supposedly valueless materialities. But it's a kind of vortex, brilliant minds at work on something that is very problematic in many ways. So, um, one, one way of framing it to get to the economy that is um, what is the steam engine of our app? <coughs> and by steam engine, I mean something that can make a new order. That doesn't mean change everything. On the surface, much of that materiality hasn't changed at all. I'd like to use the image just to zero in on something very concrete. Go to your average, modest, middle class neighborhood. The facades of the neat houses are the same. But the histories that are being constructed behind those doors have changed radically. <coughs> so there is a kind of a visual quality of this materiality that is so abundant, uh, which doesn't quite tell the full tale, it tells only part of the tale. 
So one way then that final line, you know, what is in and what is out. <clears throat> and the material surfaces do not necessarily tell you. That modest middle class household is probably on its way out. But the facade looks as neat and as solid as it was there. So there is a there is real ambiguity when we deal, if you want, with the material. Now, the steam engine of our airport, I argue it's finance. Um, and I think of finance as a capability. It's not traditional bank. The traditional bank, I should actually move back here in a minute. The traditional bank sells something it has, money. Finance sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have lies its extraordinary creativity, which is a positively dangerous creativity, but also its um, need to invade other sectors. It needs that creativity to invade other sectors. So it has to develop instruments. And I'd like to use a very concrete image. Uh, Goldman Sachs, we all know what that is. The back room, which used to be the space for the secretaries, is now the space where brilliant minds, at one point, 100 physicists, developing the algorithms that are necessary for finance to do its thing. Some of the instruments that they developed are really brilliant. And, and I don't know, you probably some of you know that we don't go the technical problem. You know, when great minds, very intelligent people, with enormous amount of knowledge, find themselves, and this is not the first time, the situation is working on something that is very complex, where we deploy their full intelligence, but the outcomes are often very simple. Brutalities, not even grand brutalities. So with finance, I see a bit of that. Now, because finance is something it does not have, it can invent instruments, and the instruments have gotten more and more invasive and more and more complex because they are now to offer some very elementary goods, very simple stuff that it financializes. So that actually raises the level of difficulty, ironically. So great complexity, very simple brutalities. Now this graph here, which, which is not my graph, this comes actually from the world of finance, this just captures one particular instrument. Um, uh, and, and it is a very interesting one, it's a very innovative instrument. And look at what I want to emphasize is the growth curve, right? Just this growth curve, look at that. From 201, less than a trillion, to uh, 207 high point in terms of value, 62 trillion. Now, 62 trillion at that time represents more than the global GDP, so four countries, including China. Secondly, within, and that is an achievement in itself, you know, that is what I mean by finance's capability. Secondly, the total value of finance at that point is 630 trillion. Now, when I confront these kinds of numbers, I ask myself questions like, a lot of questions, let me just illustrate the one. So what is the actual currency as issued by all the central banks in the world that we have? You know, how does that relate to this value of 630 trillion? The actual currency at that time is about 200 trillion, very generously measured. That means not just currency in circulation, that means currency that is also held by banks. I'm not including Bitcoin, I'm not including, you know, there is a list of about 25 that I'm aware of, uh, electronic currencies. And Bitcoin is the most famous one, but there are quite a few. Uh, like, for instance, I don't know if you know this, but in Brazil, in Argentina, they have developed one of these digital currencies that they call Gaucho. The Argentinians must have invented that one. Gaucho is a certain historic figure. <coughs> so, so, what we're talking about here is a capability that we measure in money, money as in currency issued by, by, by central banks, but that actually goes way beyond that. That is a value, at some point it ceases being money. And a footnote, a footnote, I always say, you know, finance is very good at making capital. And it would be actually almost okay if we could pull it down and materialize it into a green transport system, into make it, in other words, real in the sense, I don't know, it was ironic or straightforward. On the question, what is a real economy? So, I my my push would be: How can we bring it down? Second footnote: 
right now. But a report just came out from Basel, and Basel is sort of a command center for global finance, uh, informal command center, by the way. Uh, and the report of limited circulation, but you know, it's in the public domain if you have $3,000 to buy it. I didn't buy it, by the way, but I had access to it. So it is clear right now, in enormous detail, that the big banks, which includes the financials, etc., they are sitting on a vast amount of cash <coughs> that they don't know what to do with. They have run out of stuff to process in their way. And so there, that then makes me think again, oh my God, when you think of all the things we need, this country, for instance, I love this data, it's either 6,000 according to some expert, 15,000 according to others, bridges that will fall, they will collapse. And if you pay attention, you can sort of in your reader screen, you notice that sort of every two weeks there is a little bridge collapsing. But the answer is we don't have money. Well, what does that mean? Talk about realities, right? They are sitting on cash. And one challenge is how can we make that cash come down, you know, again, and materialize into something. Now, I want to move on a bit. This is the famous black holes. So, when Bern the group black I'm not famous for people who work on this, I don't know that. But when Bernanke was, uh, not resigned, stepped down from his mandate at the Fed, he said, among other things, and 70% uh, and of financial trading, we estimate, happens in black holes. And we do not really know what exactly happens there. Now, these financial Trading networks are private, they're run by banks, there are many banks, many powerful banks who want to access them, and they're told no, this is a very private world. And they build up, you know, what Marx would have called probably fictitious capital or something like that. And again, if we could only bring it down and capture it at the right time. Now, here is one illustration of the savagery of it all. And this is the use of a very modest asset to generate, to construct a very complex instrument that is of use to the high finance capital, you know, the high finance circuit, capital we're talking about. Um, and, um, and, and the brilliance is an illustration of what I said before, that often the more elementary, simple, and low value the asset on which you're going to work, the more complex the instrument. So a colleague of mine at uh, Columbia University, a French economist, has to study all the steps that it took to delink the instrument of high finance circuit from the actual value of the asset. And it was 16 very complex steps. And again, the math is algorithmic math, it's open structure, it is not microeconomics. Finance could not handle microeconomics. We could use it, we have a little bit use it. So we're talking about a very particular kind of economic modality, if you want. Now, I know I hope you have read a bit of that. So just to give you make it complete. Uh, for it to work, this is a story that lasted about seven years, and then the instrument was declared illegal. That's how bad it is, how brutal it is. But the cleanup phase goes is still going on, but it's not driven to an end. Um, so, to make it work, the agents who were handling it had to send, had to make a signature, had to get people to, to, to sign a contract, modest households, because all the high income houses were already owned their houses, anyhow, and they were going to follow probably for the instrument. But, so 500 contracts had to be signed a week, in order, and, and we're talking about multiple agents. 15 million, almost 15 million contracts were signed in that period of seven years. I don't know if you can imagine the, that's a kind of a materiality, all those people trying to extract signatures from those, from the, you know, these modest, these modest households who were told you can own a house, though it was not about them owning a house. The contract was always in the paper, a piece of paper. What happened to the house, to the people, didn't matter whether they paid or not paid, absolutely irrelevant. This was all about the high finance service. And this, the only reason it worked is that it put a massive amount of high-grade debt. Now, high-grade debt is its own sort of interesting between material and fiction. But, you know, it is a designated kind of debt. 
and that is how it worked. Camouflage to there were these little contracts, uh, but that the high, the high level, the high final circuit said, give me something that has a material, you know, an acid, an actual material acid. So that's how that worked. Now, the result, I think by now is familiar. This is annual. Now, these are foreclosures. Most of these foreclosures, according to the Central Bank, in fact, are uh, effective you know, in terms of evictions. That's what we're saying. 14 million uh, households out of their home. <laughs> now, the high point, as you can see, is, you know, to a 7, 8, to a 9, to a 10, it then dribbles down. The first half of 2014, you still had half a million properties. So we are talking uh, a lot of people, and I always like to say, you know, 15 million households is about 30 million people. I'm Dutch. I just grew up in and, uh, and 50 million households is about 30 million people, which is twice the population of the Netherlands of my country. In the United States, 30 million people is like a dribble of people. In my country, it is actually twice the population. So just to make it sort of concrete. Now, another element that is part of you know, this question: what is the real economy? Uh, sort of the, the, the negative side is the question of debt. One might ask oneself, what is the bridge that allows, say, Wall Street bankers to access <laughs> even the most modest household? I mean, that is actually an interesting question that is rarely asked. You see, the, the assumption is, well, of course. No, it is not. And debt in, with very modest households that are not playing the stock markets, etc., debt, household debt, is a critical bridge, and boy, has it been used. And here I'm showing you a graph that has a lot of numbers. Don't, you know, I just want to point out a few. So first I want to start with the title. So this is, by the way, I should say that most of my data comes from the IMF and from central banks. Central banks around the world are meant to be research institutions. They are that, besides, you know, setting policy. The IMF staff papers are a very interesting, I always say it's a very interesting source of data because these are not published, but they are in the public domain. And we, the citizens of the world, except maybe North Korea and such, we pay for the IMF. It is our data. We should use it, want it, we just have to give the citation. We do not have to pay. I just want people, people are never using these data, so I'm, this is my little sort of thing. Because they're very interesting. So here you are now, back to the title. Ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. Credit sounds very rich. Credit is debt. So credit, that's the language we use because it gives you the see from the eyes of the, the person who's going to go shop, I guess. Now, this is a critical period, 2000 to 2005, when these bridges are built. And look at these countries. You know, a lot of these countries are, of course, sort of entering. I, I like to take the example of Czech Republic and Hungary. In 2000, look how modest. I mean, they were not into having debt, certainly not in the Western banking system context. Um, at the same time, the United States was already over 100%. You know that that's how it works. Um, and by the way, Spain, so since I was speaking from Spain, 65% in 2000. Five years later, Spain, since I'm in Spain, it's 112. That's not good. But <laughs> Czech Republic, 8.5. To 27. That's quite a. That is a far higher rate of growth than what the United States had. Because the United States is sort of topping that. Huh? And then Hungary, 11 to almost 40 percent. Now, again, interrogating the data. I am always interrogating the data that I work with because you can ask many questions from data. So one question that I ask with this kind of data set is, who owns that debt? I think, and not everybody agrees with me, that if you are making a loan with a little local debt or a little local credit, who basically functions as a traditional bank, it lends money for an interest, and that's that, right? And then you pay back, etc. But it is in the community, it recirculates whatever the interest payment capacity that a community has. That's very important. So that you are actually contributing, you know, there is a scale of effect if you want. And, and so I went digging again into the IMF staff papers hoping to find this information, who owns the debt of these households. 
And so here's a, here, I'm just selecting a few here. So here, look at Hungary. Huh? Hungary, 40% of the debt is owned by foreign banks. And they are, I know from the data, they're German, Swiss, and, and Austrian. Those are very active banks of Germanic, Swiss would look like, you know, Swiss, etc. And um, that is not good. You understand, right, what I'm saying here. So they just stay out, and who knows what to do with it. And that is why, for instance, another argument that I'm going to make here, but to go against franchises. There are some franchising that we need for whatever reason, but most franchises, we don't need them. We should, we should make local entities. Because a local entity operates in modern space, operational space, and that space and tends to recirculate whatever the consumption capacity. Are you signaling that I have to edit? You're over time a little bit. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> because I was thinking, I thought something was saying hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done. So here I just want to show a final thing. Again, I mean, I would not have thought to address exactly this, what is the real economy here, but that the point that I'm trying to make now is, is about divergent trends. So I showed you one set of losses, basically. And now I want to show you some things. So look at this. So again, I went, to, this is the, the uh, this is the, one of the, the, the feds here. And this is corporate profits after tax in the United States. You know, up to 20 tenths. So here it goes up, up profits, then comes the crisis, right? The V here, which lasts about two days here. And then after that, this is the point the corporate profits go higher than before the crisis. I think that's the significant data. And here, corporate assets, this is now the US, it doesn't even register. Maybe it's half an hour there of crisis, you know, somewhere in there. And then it's higher than before. Final ratio of 1% wealth to median wealth after the crisis, even higher than before. So we are dealing with very divergent trends here. What is real in there? You know, is a complicated question to answer, and I've just not really uh, tried to address it. And, oh, I wanted to. <laughs> what is real? This. <laughs> this. Is real materiality. You know, ten thousand. Anybody who's heard me talk knows that I like to show this slide, no matter what the subject. Uh, <laughs> but it's amazing that how few people know this 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 map. But by now, if you were all at Columbia when I spoke two weeks ago, I apologize for repeating and for showing it again. So you already know it. Anyhow, ten thousand buildings. If this one is Utah, which is the ultimate 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 operational base, uh, full time gathering surveillance. Massive amount of material. This is very material. Is it real? And there is an economy in there right? because there's an enormous amount of profit on the part of the, the, the tech company, so to say. Is this real? I give you as a question. Thank you. I was a bit. Uh... Concerned earlier today, I was kind of trying to figure out what the question <coughs> is for this meeting. And I, I began to think it was about the digital media in search of a political project. Um, now, I have a political project which is anti capitalism. And so, the big question I ask you lot is how the hell does digital media and all the things and skills actually help with an anti capitalist project? Um, a little bit different from Kalia. I, I actually think the question why is very important. Um, you can't really figure out how until you know why. And in social sciences in general, and in fact, uh, pretty much everywhere, uh, we've moved away from the question why. For instance, in the last panel, uh, the question of time came up, and nobody said, why is this dynamism of time changing? I have a very simple answer to that, a very crude one. It's uh, that uh, value on the capital is such a necessary labor time. Time is the labor of value. The economy of time, therefore, becomes absolutely critical. Turnover time becomes absolutely valuable and critical. 
Therefore, capital has always been about the acceleration of turns over time. We therefore actually move faster and faster and faster because I have a competitive advantage I move faster than you. And this applies also to military operations as well as corporate operations and everything else. So it's simply turn over time. And if it's driven, it's not only turn over time in production, it's turn over time in circulation. And even more important, turn over time in consumption. And this has a lot to do with what urban culture has been about over the last 30 or 40 years, which is accelerating the turn over time and consumption as fast as you possibly can. I and mean, Peter Ball was very kind of appreciative when he started talking about the society and spectacle. A spectacle is one way of having turnover time almost into instantaneous. And therefore, people were more and more actually consuming as much as that spectacle. And you also reduce circulation time as much as you can by making the producer the consumer. Uh, we are both producers and consumers when we use Google and the internet and everything else. We are, the, we are actually consumers. Yes. So that uh, this is a very, so, so there's an acceleration of. You know, as an academic, I can remember the time when actually published more than one or two books in a lifetime was considered to be gross. Now you get a publishing book every two years because then you die. <laughs> you know, you just got to keep on accelerating, pumping out one more rubbish. You know, present company exactly. That's what we do. And that's what we have to do. Because this, is, this is the world we are living in. And of course, part of that also means acceleration of. Conceptual apparatus that can say anything to you, uh, but which actually seems to be happy to what you already call the already new information. So always it's going on. And it has everything to do with the acceleration of turn up the time, which uh, is actually within the history of capital, absolutely crucial. Because if you look at the history of technological dynamics, how much of it has been given over to what Marx called the annihilation space of time? Uh, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal feature. And all the time we have capital accumulation, and then it's a capital accumulation. We're going to have this sort of, sort of issue. Now, this brings me to some of the other issues that you've raised by the presentations of what you've done which have paved the way very nicely. Some of the things I would want to say. One of the things I would want to point out is that uh, this surplus of savings that we've got, you know, all this cash which is sitting around, and nobody knows what to do with it. Why? Why is that happening? What's the problem? Well, one of the arguments I made in the 17 contradictions is one of the crucial features, which actually makes me very much an anti capitalist, is that you know, capital accumulation has to occur at a compound rate. And compounding, as you know, gives you an exponential growth curve. And these exponential growth curves have very peculiar characteristics. And you reach inflection points where things start to sail off when you're at that kind of point in the history of capitalism. You look at capitalism. Has managed to do over the last 40 years. It's actually absorbed an extra billion people into the world's savings. Brought in, you know, the whole of China, all of you know, India, brought in the ex communist bloc and everything. I mean, that's a huge, huge expansion of the capitalist dynamic. Huge. Yet, at the end of it, what are we going to do? We're left with surpluses of capital, not knowing where they go. So, then, the IMF or things like that. So, this is a liquidity sloshing around the world, not knowing what to do. Go. Well, one of the things they do is they go off and they start building cities. That's what they do. And it's a great thing to do. You know, you know, so we're now building cities not for people to live in, we're, putting, we're building cities for people to invest in. That is, you're building cities so that people can store value. Or launder money, which is another way of it. Or the drug trade is, is actually filtered through construction activity. So even in you know, cities like uh, Tico and Sao Paulo are very, very, very active in property markets and, 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 and the like. So you build cities and you then kind of say, well, is city building important to the dynamics of capitalism? The answer is, well, it's always been important, but over the last 40 years it's become even more important and right now it's completely important. Uh, one economy has kept the global capital afloat uh, since 2008 in China. And, and of course, China managed to keep up its high rate of growth. How? By building cities like crazy. And in fact, if you look at the growth of GDP in China uh, for the last, uh, you know, since 2008, 25% of GDP was taken up by building houses alone. <coughs> Add to that all the infrastructure stuff, all the different, you know, 
rail networks and highway networks and water projects and all that. <coughs> My bet is that something like 50 percent of Chinese GDP has been involved in, in, in massive investment uh, in the built environment. What's the consequence of that? All those countries providing raw materials to China have done extremely well. They came out of the crisis of 2008. Chile did, you know, of course. Actually, China has consumed about two thirds of the world's copper. It's consumed half of the world's uh, steel copper. It's consumed half of the world's cement supplies. In fact, there's a figure that in the New York Financial Times came out last year that said that China, you know, since 2008, has, has actually poured more cement than the United States poured in the whole of the last century. <coughs> and you kind of go, what kind of fucking world is this? <laughs> you know? I mean, pouring cement everywhere seems to me an incredibly, incredibly good way to get out of a crisis, uh, as if the environment doesn't matter or nothing else matters. You know? Of course, we all know about those empty houses in, in China, and the property market is, is slowing down in China, and everybody's talking about, is there another crash coming? Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's slowing down. And so what's happening to the economies of uh, most of Latin America, which have reoriented themselves to the China trade, is very deep difficulty. Uh, I mean, Australia's not doing too well these days. And there are all those countries that, that, that sailed along, sailed through 2008, but actually they're getting into a downturn. And everybody's now looking to the United States. So actually, uh, we're about the only country that maybe. But what's going on in the United States? And uh, actually, there's a great deal of investments that are going on in New York City. And again, what kind of, what kind of housing are we constructing in New York City? We're building housing, affordable housing for the mass of the population living. Affordable housing for 50% of the population in New York City is probably a less than $30,000 a year. Or are we building high end condominiums for people to invest in, not necessarily to live in? And I suppose here in New York City, the same is true in London, the same is true in London. Many property market booms going on all over the place with this fantastic kind of uh, set of investments. And, things. and the, the, the thing is, it's absolutely insane. So, so you say, well, you know, I mean, you know, an architect's asked what they can do about it. Well, the answer is to stand on top of one of those buildings and shoot and say, this is insane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe you should, you know, have a demonstration on top of it. And say, This is insane. Every one of these buildings goes up. This is insane. This is insane. It is, but it is. And then you go, when you come up and I'm making these sorts of arguments, right? People say, I'm insane. I'm not insane. It's you not insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the sanity of the whole thing is the, the insanity of the whole thing. It seems to me to be really dramatic. And then you've got to sit back and look at it. And what seems to me kind of, you know, really, really, really tragic is you. Take many steps back, just look at this and say, This is this is what is happening. This is the dynamic that's, 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 that's going on. And if you can't find some other place to put this or all of the surface of savings, and, and even with all of this going on, everything going on in China, all of this stuff that's going on everywhere, it is still the case uh, that the and I imagine everybody else is saying there's a surface of, of savings, there's a savings glut in the world. And, 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 and again, this is a bit, a bit insane because we're told, being told in our journal that you are not being told in your generation, you're not saving enough. And you, and you should add to the blood of, uh, uh, of saving. So, it's, you know, so, so all of this, all of, all of, I mean, capitalism is really, really up to lunch. So when you look at this and you kind of say, well, how, how come it's got this way? Well, if we have this, you know, the, the, the word real bothers me. I, Always struck me as actually foundational about Marxist capital. I mean, Marx is a materialist, but there's something very funny that happens in the first chapter of capital. Marx talks about value. And he says value is immaterial but objective. And in fact, the whole foundation, and this of course is something that uh, Alandi and others have pointed out, that all these basic commodities like land and labor, which are not really commodities, but they have a value, it's a fiction. And, and we live with those fictions. The idea of a national economy is a fiction. But you know, we collect all this data, and you know, I don't know how to see all the data, but it's a fiction. But it's a fiction which is which is which is which is absolutely necessary because that then drives policy. So in fact, when when you look at what's happening to GDP or something like that, you look at 
very good. So GDP is down. We should be at zero GDP growth because unless we, unless we are there, we're going to just run out of pretty much everything because you know, three percent compound growth on everything that's going on in the world right now for the next you know, 500 years is kind of just completely out to lunch. Except, and this is where it gets back to this question why finance? The only form of capital that can be increased without limit is money. Okay, all the other forms. There's a limit, and there's a limit to the number of big buildings you can put up, and how many you know, million tons of cement you can pour. There are limits pretty much everywhere except on money. You can just add zero to the money supply. There's trillions of that, and that you see them, that they add it all the time. Several banks are adding them, oh, there's a problem, add a few more trillions to the, the, the money supply. You know, just, just. So, so you can go, so that can increase infinitely. So that means actually, that since the 1980s, we've been actually favoring money in uh, capital and its monetary form. Now, there have been times in the past when it wasn't so favored. Money in its commodity form was more important, or money in its production form was more important. But now it's, it's, it's capital and its money form because there is no limit to it. And therefore, we are actually living in this world in which increasingly, uh, you have to find ways to circulate that money. Now, one of the ways we've done it, of course, is to build a financial system which, which actually circulates money inside of itself, multiplies itself as it does so in all sorts of weird ways, so you come up with more money at the end. So, this is, this is how, it's, how it's working. Meanwhile, at various points, some people have to involve themselves in that system, and of course, they find out a huge kind of foreclosure thing which has gone on. And then there are various other versions of this subprime. I mean, microfinance is another subprime scam, which is a really terrific job of actually talking the poorest people in the world into the capital system uh, and making sure you can suck uh, as much wealth out of as you possibly can. But this great book came out about five years ago, and it says the wealth of the bottom of the pyramid, and what's the first line kind of says, you know, Two or three billion people in the world are living on less than two dollars a day. We have a huge market there, and we've got to learn how to get how to colonize that market. So the whole book is about corporate spending, is to colonize the market for those people who are living on less than two dollars a day, and and that's what can be one of the solutions to the dynamics. The other form of dynamics is to actually circulate uh, as fast as possible consumer revenue. So this gets me back to the inside. Much of what's been happening to the organizations over the last 30, 40 years is we've tried to actually accelerate consumption. And acceleration of consumption means, of course, that you actually have to build the infrastructures for instantaneous consumption. So you get mega projects. And all this stuff that went on in Brazil with the uh, World Cup, what you do? Yeah. Instantaneous uh, consumption of a soccer game is one thing. Building the infrastructure for it is another. And so we're building infrastructures all over the world for things of this sort. And so there are every uh, every mayor in every city is, is, is lusting after having a mega project of some kind, uh, which again is consumed with very different resources, gets you heavily into debt. And you know, it's almost every one of these cities around the big mega project and gets into debt. You know, in the Greek case, of course, the Olympic Games benefited from it enormously, didn't it? Yes. Yes. But, yes, they're very happy about it. Um, yeah, so, so here, you, here you go. This is this is the dynamic that, 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 that is there. So, when you connect all this together, you kind of say, we have to we have to actually get off this crazy system, which is you know, which is racing along at this particular way. And in order to do that, we have to understand these properties, and then we have to ask the question how. Because the question how is very difficult because most of us live in the midst of it. So, so if you try to cut it off immediately, then, then there's, you know, most of us are probably die of starvation and, and the like. So, so the real, real big problem of the how, which depends upon in what ways we can start to work on the capitalist project. And one of the things I've tried to do in 17 contributions is to say, what would constitute an anti capitalist project? What kinds of things would you have to do? How would you change the world so instead of exchange value, driving housing provision, use value became the direct concern of all housing activity. 
and but reducing man made living. Why why don't we live in a world where instead of commodifying everything like higher education, we actually turn it into a free good? Why don't we turn it into a free good? You know, housing, healthcare, all of those things, turn it into free goods and find ways to actually directly provide the necessary use value for the population to survive at a certain level. Why can't we build cities that kind of actually do that and work like that? Why can't we build cities which are also going to provide some answer to a lot of the environmental dynamics, which you see around this, which is another dimension that I haven't mentioned too, but which uh, you mentioned earlier about the biological basis for, for, for this, which is also really important. So, so here you have, it seems to be a, a kind of a, yeah, okay, there's a whole, a whole sort of project. But to sit down and kind of sit and say, okay, look, we're intelligent people, we might be aware of this. If we made all this stuff, but at this point, how of ideology, of corruption, legalized corruption of the political process, corruption of the media, corrupt, it is, is, is very, very much part of, of, of what we face. So it's a big, it becomes a big problem. But we can't get out of the big problem by finding lots of little small solutions. Small solutions are absolutely crucial in terms of what they can contribute. But unless it's put against the background of how they are all going to head up to actually address this macro problem of this crazy system, which is completely out of control, constructed out by our human ingenuity and let loose, but human ingenuity can no longer control it. So where Sam Bernanke says, we can't see what's going on in this dark world, we have no idea. And, and there's a great piece again in the financial times, a great addict to the financial times. So I agree, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, where it's such, you know, all of these people are working on compliance with, uh, with uh, yeah. actually, there's no way they're going to find out what's going on. In fact, there's actually an asset bubble in compliance activities because you're hiring more and more people to actually try and chase out the information which has disappeared before they get there. So, so this is a waste of time. And sometimes rather than everybody's going to say, forget it, no, there's no point in trying to comply with anything because it's not going to work. So this crazy system has to be confronted. And the only way to do it, it seems to me, is very simple kind of thinking about it and and and, and, and talking about it and kind of saying we're smart and that's your job. Um, you know, I'm definitely out of this. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get out of this. Yeah, I think it's really important to talk about the way that we're I'd also like to say thank you so much to the organizers for putting on the event and for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here see that invitation. Um, so, so much that you put on the table, uh, and I'd like to know where to start. Um, one thing that uh, strikes me is important to say is uh, that I really inscribed this conversation in a, in a very necessary uh, and uh, Important and I'm very happy that it's happening at uh, moment where uh, we reclaim economics as a, a place. Economics is too important to leave the economists. I don't know who said that, I've read that somewhere. Um, but it you know, feels very, very much that way. And um, uh, within architecture, it's also we have some kind of a responsibility or playing on opportunity uh, to, to do that. And I see this event as starting or contributing to that. I'm very happy about that. Um, the cognitive dissonance that we are uh, subject to, that you all outlined in, in different ways, is unbearable. Unbearable. Uh, and yet we're confronted with this consensus machine uh, of economists uh, that tell us that there's only one way. That's a situation of cognitive dissonance. Um, I mentioned that in a way also, because there is a positive positive dissonance, a uh, different type of positive positive dissonance. Uh, and in this moment, I'd like to invoke uh, a recently deceased uh, great Rwandan writer, Rwanda. Another example of cognitive dissonance, uh, who used it 
go ahead and delete uh, to really uh, change uh, the read or interrogate the read with uh, to common sense. Uh, in a way, opening up the, these kind of questions. Uh, so, and he passed away this week, and I, I think he's going to bear, bear, bear his memory in mind. Um, uh, there's an, an essence, a, a kind of work that Valerian does uh, that is very economic, but it has nothing to do with economics. And it works at the level of something like what Keller I think, was alluding to, which is about faith, which is about uh, habits of mind, retraining and focusing, uh, turning upside down. I mean, he would use that word, but hacking. Uh, but it's kind of fundamental, right? Uh, there's an aspect of what we're discussing that. Of course, you see it empirically in finance and in the graphs uh, that, that we've been discussing. Uh, but, but, uh, but there's a, a kind of biological or a kind of ecological uh, dimension. Uh, understanding that growth, eternal growth, is, is absurd. So uh, putting that into play at the level of affect and at the level of uh, meaning making and at the level of Retraining the senses uh, at the level of not being colonized by these logics. Right? I think that that's a really important aspect of the kind of work that I need to have. In a sense, I, I put it on the table uh, because um, it's very easy to, in a way, over mediate. I don't know if that's a word, but um, uh, there's, a re there's a realism in that too that I think is really. And in a way, it would be the in a way the interface between something like uh, Keller's insights, uh, provocations into uh, how to deal with this, how to interface this system, and the kind of political project uh, of American capitalism, which is so abstract and so big. And yet, we have tools for that. Some of those tools are um, these retraining of the actor. Rethinking and how to be a kind of ethical one. So uh, that's very broad, <laughs> but uh, in a way, uh, I guess the question is um, how do you unite physics and philosophy? Back to something you were saying two weeks ago, I thought it was very, very important. Um, you can't really do this, uh, address this big problem, you can't address uh, in a way the free trade zone uh, somehow without. Some kind of philosophical work, right? Uh, at, at this level of retraining aspects and uh, rethinking ethically and, and acting ethically. Not in the sense that you know what to do and you know what's right, but really as a, as a challenge for yourself. Um, so, with all of that in mind, <laughs> uh, we find ourselves in architecture in a moment where uh, it's a really atomized profession. Uh, these kind of questions are. As far as I know, pretty new, and uh, we don't really have a vocabulary or history uh, to talk about it too much. Um, and yet, we are highly embedded in organizational uh, systems and uh, institutions that mediate these conditions all the time. For example, we really work in teams, it's something that we, we do a lot, and we know how to run a project. Providing resources, we uh, make the labor productive, we are labor, we work. Uh, so there, there's this level uh, which, in which our profession is deeply embedded in it, doesn't really have a vocabulary to address it. Um, so, what about uh, social forms of organization and resistance, uh, social movements? Uh, we've had today a whole range of practices that we discussed, uh, from anonymous uh, to Using design as a kind of critical uh, aesthetic project. Um, and then there's others like unions. Uh, you know, some of us are really seriously thinking whether the architecture profession should engage in unionization. I mean, uh, how do we how, how do we take the conversation away from this level of practices and tactics and um, uh, infrastructural, financial, legal? Abstract uh, 
uh, very difficult uh, type of work. How, how can we connect that with, in a way, more activist and social type of projects? And I really, I really have in mind actual work that's happening right now. So in Greece, for example, or in Spain, uh, where these questions are, are not theoretical, where they really happen. So um, that, you know, uh, it's a bit of a fashion, but the question of the state. Uh, how, you know, how, do you have any uh, pointers for, for, for us to, how do we as architects begin to engage with this stuff? The level of institutions and at the level of uh, uh, really a political economic project. I'll say something that I wasn't going to just talk about architects and that you brought that in at the end. But I think I think there are there are major sort of histories in the making that maybe at one point could actually involve a kind of destruction of good parts. Of capitalism as a system which includes materialities and logics. Uh, and historically, you know, there are economic sectors that the only ones that can destroy them are they themselves. They finance is one of them. So there is that whole vector which is massive concentrations of power and massive concentrations of materialities in infrastructure, in now, then there is another vector which I'm particularly interested in, that, though I also work on that and I'm going to sort of stay on that. And that is this notion, sort of one very simple image for me is relocalizing of what we can relocalize. And I see that as a first step in the trajectory. We begin to mobilize. And I, I'm also, I have this project going, for instance, how we can we use digital applications that are here towards the needs of low-income communities, neighborhoods, whatever term we want to use, and low-income workers. Most apps are consumption-oriented or for right? And so I'm, the consumption data, you know, everybody's welcome if it is consumption, so that's not an issue. But the new, that some of the, the apps that the scientists are about, we create matrices of collaboration, for instance. I think it would be very interesting also for the I also think we need to innovate. And there's a whole set of, of uh, entities right now that are trying to, to develop new types of applications. I don't know if Timothy, you were the one who was speaking before in my digital administrative talk if you address that, but it's a very interesting stuff, by the way. So I think that the notion that individuals at the level of uh, sort of the models sorry, become makers, makers of the history and the economy, etc. But that doesn't necessarily deal with the, with the superpowers. So when I'm organizing, for instance, we, we, organize, we have now a domestic workers' union, right? Cleaners, nannies, etc. It looked like it was going to be impossible. It only worked in a certain kind of space. <laughs> Rich, so, you know, our cabinet, et etc. But that union has now existed and survived for two years. Which is so very still interventions in the space of power. But I think that that we, on some level, when I deal with this, I say, we forget about all that now. Forget about Wall Street, it will bring itself down. Move into making, making viable situations. And, and you know, the immigrant communities could not, the immigrants arrive, they have little, they are wind up in very degraded spaces, and they remake those spaces. They create a local economy, they create. So I think that there are these two factors. One is the big logics and materialities, etc., of the system. And the other one is locality after locality and locality, sort of a, a transversal horizontalizing of effort. And then Greece is, is to me a very interesting situation. And the way the EU is reacting, it's so extreme. And I don't want to put a data on the table because I think we should all know that. But Mr. Schäuble, you know what I'm talking about. Was vehement as opposed to Carney and, and uh, some of the other types of law. Um, says uh, contracts are not violated, contracts are not violated well. Ladies and gentlemen, the IMF cancelled 46 contracts it had with countries, with highly endemic countries, that it recognized its policies fail. So, yes, contracts can be violated, you know, and I'm waiting for the moment when Surfer says, 
what the hell are you talking about? What about the 46 countries? You know that? Where? And so I, I think the, the saddest part of that would be that they sort of submit to the IMF. I talk too much. I realize. I'm sorry. This is such an engaging question, and I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> I'm going to be probably unwelcome, uh, unwilling auxiliary to that effort, um, and we'll work on maybe something that's less automatically oppositional, less binary, and mostly here. Um, because it seems to me that there is a capacity in, in some of this. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'll say, I, will, I want to work on both, but I want, I want to introduce an auxiliary to soften up the ground so that that person who's standing with us that well in their head has a chance of some success. Um, and it is through, I mean, it's unlikely, but it is potentially through some of these spatial variables that have a degree of strength imminent in them because they are undeclared. They are, they are, they, they're part of a whole system of organization that, um, that as, as it gets crazier and crazier, it becomes more and more fictional. And this is where, this is where I start getting excited about the possibility of counseling. Um, because there, there is in that, that repetitive set of all those spatial products where our characters have turned away saying, there's nothing more we can do, you know. There's no way we can take our skills and making that outline shape and apply it to this. This doesn't apply. You can't do anything. Um, so what I've been up to is trying to figure out, you know, if there's another register of form making that can exploit all of those multipliers, um, so to actually strengthen the possibility of a of a problem. Um, so something like the free zone, which is in many ways a you know, it's a, it, in dialogue with, with Saskia, who I left a couple of weeks ago, it's pretty clear that that little freedom, like a little gear in the expulsions that you're talking about, you know, it, it's the center of offshore finance, it's, um, it's, a, a, it's a, a, a place to post cooks, so it's actually, it is actually literally a, a real estate casino, it is the you know, kind of <clears throat> embodiment of, of, of uh, money moving around the world and so on. Um, and it's a way, you know, to use one of her, one of her words, or something that has emerged after a moment of economic cleansing into a kind of fantasy world, you know, a, a bizarre, intentional community that has faith in golf and crazy palaces and so on. So that's where, again, one sees the possibility of, of an introducing an active form that's also about fiction and persuasion. And I don't know if you're interested in. It, it's pretty clear also that that zone, just given what we know about kind of, you know, urbanism 101, because of its crazy desire to be a city now, um, going from a warehousing compound to a city, it has within it the antidote of its own reversal. Um, uh, and there's ways of kind of manipulating some of those, that the incentives in that incentivized urbanism so that the information of the city, the intelligence, the power, information of the city um, works against the, 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 the zone. Pretend, what I've been talking about is taking selected zone incentives, re removing them from the sort of exterior, the sort of um, independent, the authority that's independent from the host country, return them to existing cities instead of a sort of office. And then return to the rule of law, return the oversight of labor to the rule of law, and, and let some of those incentives be part of, of an interplay within the city. That, that, uh, and that we as, I, I'm not talking to but, but, but if we as architects don't go to those places and, and provide another self-congratulatory master plan, and then leave, 
and say, well, they didn't do our master plan because it's clearly they, you know, they weren't smart enough to recognize the perfection of it. Um, but instead, that what, what we might do is think more about a kind of active form of what, where our business is not making the object, but, but introducing leakages, counterbalancing leakages that, that run against accumulations of power. I think there are a number of things to be done. One is, um, uh, I think, I think a, a system level of machine is very, very important. Uh, I think, uh, particularly by the form of machine, which comes from the architectural order, uh, the critique of mega projects, for example, and, and uh, thinking of that we're talking about. I mean, this, but again, you know, it's not enough to somebody say, well, it's not very good and what we want it. It has to be a public campaign and, and resources have to be mobilized and use all the kinds of things that they say, oh, we're going to build a new stadium that's going to create 150,000 jobs. And then 20 years later, somebody goes back to the and find out that we end up negative 20,000 jobs. You know, these kinds of things. And so there's lots of evidence around it. So you create the evidence. And, and this means you're not going to be very popular with construction industry, corporate, and the rest of the finance here. So that's one level at which the work can be done. And I think uh, uh, politically that is used, and you can do a lot of that. And there's a perfect kind of work. And, and then use it specifically uh, in relationship to various uh, things that are going on. And I've worked with Kiko. And he does going to decide that how to that free in 2016. He uh, does going to need something like 40,000 hotel beds uh, for that mega project. I mean, the irony is, it's having that too. It's the mega project. And it's only got 20,000 right now. So it's going to have to actually wipe out and come from the city in order to build that hotel. And then, I mean, actually, we're trying to project some of the entire <coughs> structure coming to the city. So, yeah, there's work to be done in the market, which is actually actually uh, about two thirds of the fresh fruit and vegetables that come into the city, come into the market, which is largely run by indigenous populations. Uh, the government's trying to shut it all into supermarkets, so it's going to come from the board and all that, you know. So, so again, there's the, the project to be done. But then there are other things that we need to be investigated. Uh, Things like alternative ownership or security structures. And then, uh, even in the, in the United States, you have uh, uh, things like uh, you know, sort of uh, co-ops, you've got uh, uh, community land trusts, you've got forms of, uh, of ownership, uh, which have been extensively used in, in other parts of the world, including the Union has one here. Uh, and and, okay, so what we do is we start to explore these alternative uh, property ownership structures, which actually then lead into the possibility of creating concrete proposals. And one of the things that was incredible about what happened with Dr. Mike Sandy was it was a lot of work that young white people out there and it was very kind of work, but they never had an alternative plan. That is, we said, you know, wouldn't it be great if people were going out and said, okay, it's an open office, let's set up, let's set up. Uh, a community land trust where everybody gets their housing back on a different um, basis and you know, she was able to change the basis and change the whole basis upon, upon which uh, uh, people's ideology gets, gets transformed as you move on this private ownership to a land trust. So there are things like that, uh, it seems to be done. And there are things that are being done, uh, for instance, right now, I'm very interested in what's going on in the uh, Northern area of Syria, the Lama, the Bani, where they're actually producing the same auction type, so they would be marked out by the structure of governance and so on, and then try to set up common property structures and common property and not. So they're trying to do something radically different. So there are there are things that this still going on. And it seems to me to be first off, what's amazing to me is a sort of talk around not much knowledge of it. Basically, you go back to the you know, learn the standard and stuff, you don't know the non-standard stuff at all. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it's 
So, so this is a this is mild that seems to me. There's a demand that can come from students, and so that uh, the students are uh, actually being very active, they're often by the hands of them and whereas other places saying the kind of thing we're being taught is totally irrelevant to understand what should be done in the world right now. Then you have voice in all of it. You don't have to believe in lessons, I mean, you can't even tell them. You know, you know, you know, you know, you've got to construct a, a new form of knowledge, and I think that there, there are things to be done that we saw. And, and uh, you know, Montreal is another place where the student movement is connected with the neighborhood movement, uh, which connects also to these other forms of property like structures. And, 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 and then things are really you know, buzzing along in a, in a completely different I mentioned. So there's lots of things to be done at that level. The reason I'm going to want to know what the reason is important is because you have to have in the back of your mind an understanding of where this is all coming from and what it is you're trying to contribute to when you're doing these things. There's lots of mini actions going on all over the place right now. Everybody's doing something different. And if you kind of say, yeah, but this is what we're doing, what's that going to be? Then you have to have a way of doing that. Right? Yeah. And if you kind of say, yeah, okay, well, what's that cat is about this? You then got to start actually put this into a much broader context. So you've got to stop this monster, which is a monster of our own design, and, 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 and turn it around. But I think there's, there's many things to be done at many different levels. For instance, in public art, there are a lot of architects here who are actually unemployed. You're probably looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> They're unemployed, so they have jobs. But on weekends, what do they do? They go build communities and they know about communities. And they're actually built two wonderful communities and the middle of the building, and it's fantastic. And, and they've got local people who are actually working with them on getting the materials in the worst year. Guess who's the big enemy of this? The local mayor doesn't like this because it challenges so you've got to challenge the local state. You've got to push the local state so the local state becomes a part of what you're doing as opposed to the enemy. Uh, but you know, if you, particularly in Colombia, if you challenge local power structures, it's very good. It is. You know, people get killed by paranoid organizations and so on. So it's not, it's not, it's not fun and games. But, it's, but there are things to be done, and people are, 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 are doing it. If you, if you talk to people who are involved in these kinds of activities, I think they're all fully aware, fully aware that, that the, this is just one moment in terms of. Uh, Uh, the situation in many of these countries, not only the very good job, but it's kind of desperate in many ways. And something's going to have to happen. So this generation of students is on, and if there's these activities going on around the place, if you can join in and somehow you keep them by social movement, then actually, you know, Maybe, are there any questions from the audience? This was a good finale, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sort of some fresh stuff out there that you architects can all start working on. <laughs> just say one thing. I, um, just because the, to some degree, the, the real flipped out of focus in some ways um, here, and, and just to, to talk about a different sort of haunting that, that was. Um, Motivating the students in asking this question, which is the way in which often in architecture, uh, certain forms of intellectual work or even working exhibitions and publications that doesn't take the form of something like material building is, is uh, dismissed as not having sort of traction on the ground. And, and so, it was part of the ambition of bringing in a set of other sort of material was to, you know, to ask exactly how this figure of the real could you know, operate otherwise. And, and so precisely, you know, kind of remarkable shift to the forms of performativity that, of course, to us are precisely some of the most powerful vectors that in architecture that has very little to do with the conventional discourse of, you know, construction, etc. And so, so this is part of the space that's motivating the the um, uh, scare quotes around around the real, sort of interrogation of the real as to how we might actually begin to situate it as as a provocation and one that's radically ambiguous between uh, the other states of contemporary valence and its potential revalencing through uh, encountering other discourses. So I just wanted to 
Um, uh, because there's many slices through this uh, question that uh, the we were trying to be to the Well, the average in the environment is very high. Right, because in a way, we, we set a kind of contact that, at least in one sense, points to the importance of a certain kind of local condition where you can intervene. The two communities, you know, built by unemployed architects, etc. I mean, that is just a very dramatic example. But when I look at what's happening, I check the whole power system. We cannot spend you know, all our energy on the power system, right? We need to become makers again. And so there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, and work in the level. Yes. work also in, in intellectual theoretical. I mean, the, the work of course, of takes course. place in many locations. Okay. Yeah. So this is right. this is why we want to keep some attention. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know exactly who is holding the book on top of the skyscraper and who is working elsewhere. And I think this was really. I think if you said performative or something like that, yeah. some things, you know, in inter recent discussions, I'm like, but that's like still in this kind of blurry mm -hmm. thing or something that will be miniaturized mm -hmm. in the gallery or something like that. And I feel exactly the opposite of it. I think this is like something where we, we ultimately um, sort of very practical and empowering using all of our skills, all the skills we have of, you know, uh, uh, measure and shape making, all of that, but also in a kind of time release to form an extent.